Call the Newport City Council meeting to order for Monday, October 15th, 2018, 6.30 p.m. The City Council room. Um, all members of the council are present, with the exception of Mr. Bowen, who is absent this evening. Others present include Jim Johnson, our clerk treasurer, and Laura Dogan, our city manager. We need to make um, a couple changes to the agenda. We need to move number six and seven, the executive sessions. They will be after number nine, old business. So I'll have to move those. We'll need a motion on that effect. And we'll also need a motion on executive session, which was currently seven, to discuss lease negotiation. We need to also add possible vote on that one. So with that, those are the changes that we need to make to the agenda. And I would entertain a motion. So moved. A motion has been made. Is there a second? <coughs> second discussion on the agenda changes. And hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Have it. Motion carries. The next item is to approve the minutes of October 1st, 2018. I trust the council members had a chance to review the minutes. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes as presented. A motion has been made. Is there a second? I'll second it. Made and seconded to approve the minutes. Any discussion on the minutes and on the motion? Then hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. The next item is comments by members of the public. Um, we have a few people who signed up. If that is, if you had signed up to speak regarding item number five, um, which was a presentation by Mr. Benoit of Lynn Magal Conservation and Charlie Prano, um, I'm going to allow public comment during that time. Can we make sure that the normal two minutes that we are, are allowed now will be allowed then? I will do it at my discretion. Uh, and Excuse me, let me finish. I will gauge how many people are speaking. I will gauge the length of time. I will time it on my watch. But it is up to me, and I will gauge it. And generally, I've been lenient and let people go for two minutes or more. And so it is up to me as the chair of the board to set the time. And I will gauge based upon the number of people who wish to speak. And, and also, there are some people here who are not familiar with um, our process, um, and they may not know that they need to sign up ahead. Are you going to allow them to speak, or do you want them to sign up now? As there's well? no need to sign up if there's no need to sign up if it's regarding an agenda item. Public comments where people sign up are for those who wish to make comments on items that are not on the agenda or are not being voted on. Okay, and with that. Anybody have any comments that they wish to make um, who signed up that are not related to the presentation? Okay, then we'll move on. The next item is a presentation by Green Lantern Solar. <coughs> Sam Carlson. Carlson, I mean, sorry, yes. Carlson. Permission to yes. approach? I'm sorry for showing my back to you. I'm, we're happy you to stand, stand if, if you that's, wish. No if that's better. That, Sure, let's do that. Um, Sam Carlson, Victor Veve, we both work for Green Lantern Solar. Uh, we are a solar development company that's based in Waterbury, Vermont. We are an exclusively Vermont-based company. Uh, we work throughout the state of Vermont from Broward to Newport. Uh, we have about 50 solar projects uh, in operation around the state. We are what's called a commercial scale net metering company, meaning we don't do any project larger than four acres. Most of our projects are one acre. In power terms, that's between 
150 kilowatt array and a 500 kilowatt array. So we don't do residential rooftops. We don't do gigantic 20 megawatt projects. Um, we are main customers because we're a net metering solar company. Our cities and schools, and I have just an updated list. If you would kindly just pass that around. That shows all of our projects that we have developed and are operating in Vermont, and it shows you who our customers are. Again, the, the bulk of those customers are towns and public schools, some private schools as well. Um, we also work with ski areas uh, quite extensively because they have large electricity expenditures, and they're interested in offsetting those expenditures through solar net metering. Would it be useful for everyone to just explain briefly how the mechanism of solar net metering works for, to enable towns to save money? You may want to have just a brief just, just very quickly. So uh, the legislation that's passed by the Vermont State Legislature approved by the governor with respect to solar net metering allows solar arrays that are up to about four acres in size, so up to a 500 kilowatt array, to do what's called net metering. That means we, we build a solar array, we plug it into the grid. The utility, in this case here, would be Vermont Electric Co-op. Further south would be Green Mountain Power. The utility doesn't pay any money for that electricity. <coughs> the electricity just goes wherever it's needed in the ISO New England grid. For every kilowatt hour of electricity that goes into the grid, the utility, again Vermont Electric Co-op, issues a credit a net metering credit. And that credit, think of that as like a Dick's debit card. Right? It, allows you, it allows you to reduce whatever you are going to spend at Dick's to the value of that card. If you have a hundred dollar debit card at Dick's, you can go to Dick's without a hundred dollars debit card and spend up to a hundred dollars, use your debit card, and you didn't pay any money. Right? Similarly, a net metering credit. If we sell that credit to a city or a town, the town can then use that credit to pay down their electricity bill. So you'll say, well, why would a town pay 100 bucks for credits to reduce their bill by 100 bucks? Wouldn't do it, right? We sell those credits that are generated by the solar array at a discount. So that's like if you have a $100 Dick's debit card, but you only paid $88 for it, you'd save 12 bucks. And you'd say, I'd do that all day long. I'll give you 88 bucks, you give me a $100 debit card, and I'd go into Dick's. That's basically the offer that we're making to the city of Newport, is we're offering to sell these net metering credits at a discount to the city of Newport. Newport then deducts from their electricity bill, the value of those credits. We have right now a 500 kilowatt array in Leamington, Vermont, that's fully permitted by the Public Utility Commission, <coughs> executed land leases, uh, all permits are in place, we're ready to go to construction. No, it's in a preferred site, which is a sand pit, and uh, it's aesthetically out of sight, out of mind. Most of our projects for Green Lantern you will never see. They're completely out of sight. So it's uh, met with town approval and it's been fully permanent. So the project is, is ready to be built. So the city of Newport has electricity expenditures that are in the realm of $200,000. The city of Newport could do net metering, purchasing these net metering credits from the solar array and save around $18,000 a year for the next 20 years at no cost, at no risk, at no liability. It's basically a, a purchase contract whereby the city of Newport would say, we agree to buy these credits at this guaranteed percentage discount and we'll apply those credits to our VEC bill 
and we'll save money on our electricity expenditures. Again, it doesn't, there's no upfront cost or investment. The city doesn't own the array, so there's no insurance, there's no liability. All it is is buying that Dick's debit card that's worth 100 bucks for 88 bucks and doing it at a larger scale so that it can generate around $18,000 a year in savings. That depends on how many credits the city of Newport, if they want to go forward, wants to buy. That takes a little bit more of a deeper dive into your electricity expenditures by meter to see exactly how much net metering we could do. Yeah. And just to be clear, you have no physical attachment to the actual solar array. This is just a contract for the power credits that are produced. The power credits. Now my question is, so we buy, oh, I don't know, 100, I'll just do a small scale. We buy 100 watts a month. That's tiny, but I'm just using an example right. of net metering credits. What if you produce a lot less? Does our bill go down that we have to pay you, or is this a fixed net metering that whether you produce it or not? Right. So the way that the billing works, you the city would be billed monthly based on the previous month's actual production and allocation of credits to the city's meters. So the city would never be paying for credits it hadn't already received. Okay. Okay. Um, the, just to give you a sense of scale, a 500 kilowatt array would offset somewhere around $140,000 of electricity expenditures, just as, a, as an order of magnitude. And we also bill for actuals, and we can set up the fiscal year to run with your fiscal year. We do that with a lot of towns and, and cities, so that it's important for you guys to, to be on the actual cycle that, that you guys run in. Now, our, if we enter into this, this would be based upon the Lemington site, because I know you had one as proposed for Derby. For Derby, right. So I was here 18 months ago, and we had a similar discussion. The <coughs> Derby project is still in permitting. It does not have its certificate of public good yet uh, from the Public Utility Commission. And so I've been keeping Laura sort of informed as to why we don't have that permit yet. But now that we have this other project that is permitted, we said, well, we ought to at least let you know that the opportunity is there for you to move forward on this Lemington 500 kilowatt array that is fully permitted and ready to go and not wait for Derby. We still expect that the Derby project will be permitted, but it hasn't come through yet, so it's a, it's a timing question. That's why Which also, um, I was at a presentation where they talked about the she effect, mm -hmm. the Sheffield um, pipes. You know, this this is not in that territory whatsoever. It's already been approved. It's been approved, yeah. but, but we still have the issue of too much power where they have to shut things down. Leave not on this project. No, no, but I want to make, let me finish. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. The issue that I just want to make sure because for anybody who might happen to be going by Sheffield Heights and you see the turbines turned off, it's because we're producing too much power and the power grid can't handle it. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's the issue. And it's all these projects feeding into it that's causing that issue. And the presentation is, it's going to take a it affects all of us in Vermont, and I just wanted to have that all on the table because I didn't know if you're, this is probably this is small enough so you're not regulated by as ISO New England, correct? Because you're below that threshold, correct? But it still it adds to that effect, that issue that Vermont Electric Co-op is having issues with, um, um, other power companies in Northern Vermont I know are all having issues with that effect because the whole power grid need, actually in, in reality. The whole power grid here needs to be upgraded because there are days that it cannot handle all the renewables being produced. Correct. So the Derby project is caught up in this Sheffield Highgate export interface, right, which is a I really mean. weird term. Um, the Lemington project is outside of the Sheffield Highgate export interface. Okay. And that's in part why it's fully <laughs> permitted, and there are no problems with that. So it that. Lemington three-phase line is doesn't connect into the Sheffield Highgate area. 
So it doesn't have the problems linking with the wind turbine production and the challenges of getting so much wind power out through outdated or too small transmission lines to the south. So that's that's really the that's why we're here tonight is because the Leamington project is outside of the Sheffield Highgate export interface doesn't cause any issues for any of the wind projects or anything else and yet is in BPC territory and, and, and that's why it's available. Okay. Council members? So just to, just to reiterate, to, we can't tell you exactly how much the city could save until we can do a deeper dive into your electricity <coughs> expenditures by meter to see exactly what's the optimum allocation of net metering credits to, uh, to your bills. So it can be as much as about 18,500 a year if the city takes all of that 500 kilowatt array. It might be less if the city's electricity expenditures and the metering are such that we can't allocate all of it to the city. So we don't know that until we can actually really dive into the expenditures. And Laura and I will have this discussion. Because because we already have one, another net meeting credit and, and the, the law, we can only have so much. Well, we have uh, one meter that is already in net metering arrangement, so that one is not part of this. So what we need to do is do the assessment that you're speaking of to determine which would be the most advantageous. We don't know that yet. So um, if the council is interested in pursuing this, I would request a motion um, to allow me to do some, some more work um, with uh, Green Lantern as well as our city attorney so we can really iron out the, the terms of any duration and terms of a contract and then come back. So basically this would be a, a one acre array that you would set up for this area? Three and, oh. and a half basically. Okay. The actual footprint is three and a half but with shading four. Okay. And it's in a, a reclaimed sand pit. So we're, we're, we're reclaiming the sand pit. That was going to be my next question. Yep. Exactly where we be located. Yeah, Lemington off of, uh, you know, Colebrook, New Hampshire? Mm -hmm. Right across the bridge, there's a big sand pit on the, if you're going north towards Canaan on the left. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's right there, and it's a part okay. of it. It's going to be an operating pit on one side, and then for their phase reclamation, we're, we're reclamating the three and a half, four acres for, for uh, and it's already been, everything's done. Like, it's ready to be built. It's a good reuse of land too, because otherwise it would just be sitting there, you know, possibly not being reclaimed. Because it allows, you know, the solar allows a lot of reclamation in the state of Vermont, which is you know, the purpose of putting it in these sites to, to further the, the land use and you know, some taxes for the town of Huntington. It helps out a lot, even this small project. This is a very small town. Are other questions from the council members? Yes. Laura, this agreement here, um, obviously you'd be sending this off to Laura to look at it because there are quite a few discrepancies that I noticed mm -hmm. on this. Okay. Um, other than that, no, I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Mr. Ross, anything? Then we would need. Before I open it up to the floor, we would need, on this one, we would need a motion if you still want to have the manager proceed to work on this. And then I'm going to open it up to the floor after. And I would make that motion and that we have the city manager go ahead and pass this by the city lawyers and um, also check with the other agreement that we have and see if it would be feasible for the city to Okay. Motion to be made. Is there a second? I'll second it. Made and seconded. And now I'm going to open it for discussion. The credits are denominated in dollars or kilowatt hours? Dollars. A net metering credit is just a financial unit. Just like a Dick's debit card is a financial unit. So, yeah. 
for every kilowatt hour of electricity, which is a physical unit, the utility issues a net metering credit, which has a financial value of 19 and a half cents. So this is 19, that was a good question, because I just thought of, this is 19 and a half cents, because residential is 14 and a half. Right, so right. actually just, this is, so okay, so this would be 16 change. I can get you the real number. But it's higher than the residential, but less than the other. Yeah, well, 16. the residential rate for VEC is pretty high. I'm on VEC. <coughs> so we're, we're at no, 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 I'm thinking about the net metering credit that you right. get. It should be about 17 and a half cents. It's the median of, yeah, I can get you the, the, the number. So the way that the value of the net metering credit is determined is it's, it's the weighted average uh, for Vermont, which is about 15 and a half cents, plus preferred site. It being a preferred site, which you get another penny, plus we're turning over the renewable energy certificates, which is sort of the, it's kind of a confusing thing, but they're, they're legally the environmental attributes of being clean renewable energy, those get turned over, the RECs get turned over to VEC, and VEC then pays uh, a, another two cents. So, uh, and then we, discount that value as per the net metering agreement that you have in front of you. Okay. Right. Um, I, I have three questions. One is, you mentioned 20 years. Are we committed to a 20-year contract? Two, you say you're building this thing in Leamington. When would the R credit start? And three, can you explain to me who's paying the extra money for the credit? Because your, your company is not giving away energy for free, you're clearly making a profit. Sure, so I can address uh, some of those and then Vic, you can talk about the construction side of things. <coughs> Net metering here in Vermont sort of derives, if we walk it back historically, to the Obama 2009 stimulus package, which put into place investment tax credits for renewable energy. There's a 30% investment tax credit for renewable energy. There's also accelerated depreciation for investments in renewable energy. So we're sort of leveraging those federal investment tax credits and accelerated depreciation opportunities. That's what allows us to offer to a city or a school which can't take advantage of those tax and depreciation uh, opportunities because towns and schools aren't paying taxes. That's what allows us to offer that as a discount. So we can still monetize those credits by selling them at a discount and we can make money doing that. But at the same time, the city can make money doing it. So we're sort of splitting, in a sense, those investment tax credits and accelerated depreciation opportunities. Um, that's the simplest way I can explain. Um, your, on the construction you timeline, 20 years. 20 years, yes. The reason why it's a 20 year contract is because a solar array of this type uh, has a big upfront investment. It's on the order of 1.7 million, probably. And it takes a long time to pay that back selling the credits to a city of Newport or to the Johnson Elementary School or whatever. It takes about 15 years to pay back that big upfront investment. So the bank, when we go to the bank and say, we need to borrow $1.7 million so we can build this array, the bank wants to see, well, what's your cash flow? How are you going to pay us back? Where's your net metering agreement that's 20 years long so the bank knows they're going to get repaid? If we went to the bank with a 10-year net meter in agreement, they would say no, no money. My Vermont joke is it's not a cash cow, it's a steady milker. So it's, <laughs> um, as far as the construction, can you repeat your questions? So I wanted answer? to know when we could start this if Lemington's not even, it, it's just a sand pit right now. We can't start it until it's commissioned. You, yep. you're fully yep. operable. Yep, exactly. Which you expect to be? Um, in a perfect world, in the spring it will be built. It takes about 10 to 15 weeks to build, so it, it, it really depends on how, how much snow and what the, the climate is. Okay. 
that allows for we would hope for April or May commission. Anything else? Then we have a motion on the floor. Any other discussion? I do have one more. Go question. ahead. Uh, you were talking about the uh, thirty percent credit that you get from the federal government, basically. What happens if that's reduced or taken away? Right. So that is a uh, that investment tax credit applies to the year that the array is commissioned. So. If this solar array gets commissioned in 2019, that 30% inve investment tax credit is in place. For 20 years? Well, it's in, once, it's, once it's commissioned, it's locked in. So the owner of the array basically gets that tax credit. It doesn't, so it's, it, there is no sort of even need to grandfather anything because it's just taken in, in the year that it's commissioned. It's, it's immediate. Um, fun fact, uh, this was the Obama stimulus package. It was due to expire with the end of Obama's uh, <clears throat> administration at the end of 2016. My initial contract ended at the end of 2016. The last act of John Boehner and Mitch McConnell was to extend this investment tax credit until 2021 uh, because there have been so many jobs and so much economic activity that was linked to this uh, investment tax credit. Uh, so uh, it was the Republican administration, actually, Congress, that extended the Obama stimulus package and the investment tax credits through 2021. Thank you. Yep. Go ahead. I'm just sitting here. Does this involve carbon credits also? Not carbon credits. It involves these renewable energy certificates, or RECs. And, and in a sense, that's kind of like your carbon credit. It's, it's the environmental attribute, the fact that this is nice, clean energy. Vermont Electric Co-op has statutory requirements of how much of their electricity has to come from renewable sources. So this helps VEC vis-a-vis -vis the state to say we're complying with the state's renewable energy targets. And are those sellable? The electric company we can't say what they'll do with them, but most likely they're going towards the tier, tier one. <laughs> they used to be sold out of state until about two years ago. And then the state of Vermont said it's wrong for solar developers to be selling their renewable energy certificates to a coal. Yeah, and we're actually happy they did because yeah. it, it, it makes it a truly renewable, you know, project. And we're, we're from here, you know, Stay here. We've got a lot of projects we're taking care of for the long haul. So, right. But you're you're right to ask the question. It used to be that they were sold out of state, but starting two years ago, uh, that stopped. Okay. Anything else? Then we do have a motion, and it was seconded. Um, then all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. The next item on the agenda is presentation by Robert Benoit of Memph Magog Conservation and Charlie Pronto from Dump. Council, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for accepting the Memphis Mega Conservation at your board meeting tonight. Who are we? We have been here for 51 years. We have 650 families on the Canadian side of the lake who are members. For the past 51 years, we have been working to protect that lake and its improvement with the resident, the municipality, the province of Quebec, and the government of Canada. They all know that we are here tonight. We have closed a garbage site in Mega many years ago on the shore of the lake. We have helped change the law to force the reforestation of the shoreline of the lake. We discussed with municipality to improve the zoning on, on to improve the zoning regulation. 
In other words, as volontaire, everything that will harm the health of the lake is our concern. You realize that a white population of 175,000 people is drinking, cooking, washing with the water of Lake Nantumega. Cities such as Sherbrooke, Maydock, and a large number of other cities such as the Monk, Hermitage Club, Mansonville, Lenoxville, saint Eli, Deauville, are using that water from the Lake Nantumega. All the residents of the Canadian site and its mayor and council are greatly concerned by the fact that your municipality accept to dump into the lake through your treatment plant two big truck of toxic leachage every day of the year. And I will give you later on the memoir of the MRC wrote by Sherbrooke, Magog, and the MRC about the fact that they are really worried about it. Not matter what some people say in this municipality, the municipality of Sherbrooke Mega are really worried the water they use is coming from this lake. And I give you their memoir after. Tonight, we have the Council of Newport as good neighbors who is careful with the dollar of their citizen not to throw your juice from your trash in Lake Memphremega. You could answer me that the quality of the water we, we drain for the moment is good quality. And you will be right. But the time will show us that the biological accumulation will finally kill the quality of our water. And also, it is also your water in Newport. 71% of the water in Lake Memphremega from the United States from four rivers, Barton, Black, Clyde, and John River. Lake water stay in the lake for more than two years and build up chemicals. There is a chemical accumulation that you like it or not, the lake is not a river. You have been elected by your population, and we take for granted that you are wise people. The wise person recognized that the precautionary principle must be applied. The great problem with the environmental world are problems who are slowly created like a stair. You can see them building up and building up. But not only they take a hell of a long time to build, but they take generation to solve. The plastic in the ocean, we're never going to see the end of it. The warming up of the world, I don't think I will be there if they ever succeed. And the, 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 the acid rain, all the tree got really affected by it. And we don't know how to solve this problem. <clears throat> so for generations that will follow us, let's be sure that we done our own work conscientiously. And we ask you, Mr. Mayor, and member of this council of Newport, please stop dumping the toxic garbage juice from the Coventry in that beautiful lake. And, you know, be part of the solution, not the problem. That's what we're asking you tonight. That's what the citizen of the MRC, Manfred Magog, and the city of Sherbrooke are asking you. Be part of the solution, not of the problem. And I'd like to give you the history of MCI and the memoir of the MRC. And I understand you will be meeting one mayor and perhaps also somebody from the city of Sherbrooke in the next few days. So I think I represent, MCI represent here tonight, a large, large, <coughs> large approbation from the people in our area. If you permit, I will ask the Director General of MCI, who is a biologist, to give you a few words, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Thank you. Good evening. <coughs> uh, as you see, MCI is concerned about the presence of the landfill close the lake, about this expansion, and about the treatment of leachate in Newport. The waste buried in the landfill contains thousands of contaminants. A <coughs> high concentration of PFAS, an excessively toxic pollutant, was found near the, the site, and a lower concentration near a line part of the site. Preventing contaminants from migrating from the site to Lake Memphremagog is a major concern for us. These PFAS test results show enough data to warrant a full investigation 
before an expansion occurs. But now the government of Vermont have accepted the expansion with conditions to address concern regarding PFAS in the leachate, which means the government still have questions about PFAS contamination. The concerns about the discharging treated leachate in Lake Memphremagog is not new. A report conducted in 2004 concluded that it will be risky and imprudent to discharge leachate into Lake Memphremagog due to the risk of unknown and unregulated contaminants. The report used to restrict all leachate discharge into the lake's watershed. This part, despite this recommendation, since 2009, a part of the leachate from the landfill is treated at the Newport Wastewater Treatment Facility, a municipal facility. Thus, it's not appropriate to treat leachate. There is big concerns about this treatment. And because the leachate analysis in Newport does not include many chemicals, we don't know the impact of the leachate on Lake Memphremagog. We do not understand how an important test like the wet test, usually done in Vermont and Quebec treatment plants, was not done at the Newport plant outlet since 2008, when leachate is treated at the plant since 2009. The wet test is a test that consists to put animal organisms like trout in the outlet of the treatment plant to see the effect of the wastewater on this, these animals. The fate of leachate contaminants throughout the treatment process and the cumulative effects in Lake Memphremagog are unknown. Because the municipal treatment plant is not appropriate to treat leachate, and because we don't know the effect of the leachate on Lake Memphremagog, our deepest wish is to stop right now the treatment of the leachate uh, in the Newport treatment plant. Thank you to hear us. Okay, um, so thank you. So I'm not going to get into uh, the same discussion that we got into the last time. I've already um, had that discussion with you folks. Um, what I want to talk to you about is what probably has, dis uh, has uh, happened since our last and um, of course one of the obvious ones is that the permit or certification uh, for the solid waste portion of um, the landfill has been uh, approved by the, by the agency of natural resources. <clears throat> they called me up and told me they were sorry, but um, that's a lot of the issues that we have are not part of the solid waste portion of the permit. Um, if you saw the Channel 3 News article um, last night or the night before, you had Chuck Schwer, who is the head of the uh, Agency of Natural Resource Solid Waste Division, said that contaminants were not a consideration in giving this permit. So, so the, they issued this permit because Casella meets all the guidelines that the Agency of Natural Resources has for that small section. They look at a they look at a really small sex segment of it. Um, I told you before that uh, Casella does what they are uh, required to do, and they and they do it well. Um, what our problem has been right along is what the Agency of Natural Resources and the state requires them to do. We have a few other issues other than that, but that's basically the, the deal. So, um, I'm going to get into what we know and what we don't know, but, I, but since uh, two, uh, October 10th, there were two headlines in the Newport paper. One of them was public safety people tour the uh, Washington Electric Plant, the methane treatment plant over there. And some people from Casella's were asked questions. Um, so in, and I just took it out of this out of the Newport paper. It says Casella said they have an interest to protect the environment, and uh, they will be doing a phase to put the online metal landfill into a new liner. What they didn't say is that is not scheduled for 20 years. So that's the that's the landfill that's leaking. 
there, uh, I believe it's phase five or six, I'm, I'm not sure what phase it is, but um, hasn't been started, has, is not a requirement of the permit that solid waste gave them. And the last discussion that we had uh, said it was probably be 20 years from now. So, um, and Casella said that they are trying to prevent pollution from migrating further into the wetland. When they were here at your meeting, they told you it wasn't leaking. <clears throat> but apparently it is migrating. And when you look up the word migrate, it moves from one area to the other. So I assume that's leaking. Um, are you referring to nettle, dude? Yes. You're still talking about nettle. Okay, still, just yeah. Um, um, so I, you know, I think, they, they, I mean, they can answer for themselves. They're here. Um, but the, uh, if you call the Agency of Natural Resources and you call um, Department of Environmental Conservation and you say, uh, is leachate leaking into the groundwater of, near Casella? And they will say yes. Um, what they don't know is if it's leaking beyond their property line, um, be, partly because they haven't tested for it. I asked for the PFOA section of it. I asked Jeff Bordeaux, said, have you tested? Do you have the test results tested in the Black River around there? And he said, no, we haven't tested for PFOAs around there. I said, then how do you know that it's not getting into the environment? He did not have an answer for me. Um, they said something about um, they did some testing for um, salt or saline or something that gets down in there. And because that wasn't present, they assumed the others aren't present. Um, but it was just, it's just a, a speculation, so. Um, the, other, the other part that was in that, in that article was, uh, Casella was saying that if the permit to expand is not approved, the waste would have to be trucked out of state, which will impact, impact air pollution and every truck traffic, which I kind of laughed at, because what they didn't say is that's exactly what's happening now except it's all coming to Cobbett Creek. It's coming from all across the state, um, which is not anything that you guys have a right to. I'm just, what I'm trying to put in place here is when you ask a question, a lot of times you get a dance, and, and it's, not, it's not actually a, 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 a mistruth. It's just sometimes it eliminates things that, um, that they aren't comfortable with. So. State officials have also said in that same article that it is not reasonable to truck trash from all over Vermont and New England to Coventry. That was in that article. State officials said we need another landfill in Vermont. What they didn't say was that currently there is no such landfill being planned, according to the ANR, because the Agency of Natural Resources has not done their job. This is the only option. Part of the reason that permit was issued is because they don't have any other options. Solid waste is, they are in charge of it. There has to be a place to dump the trash. They don't have any other options. They don't have any other plans. They haven't studied any other options. They haven't studied any other plans. The only other certified um, place in the state of Vermont uh, for a landfill is in Chittenden County. And the Chittenden County Solid Waste District decided not to do it, and their reason, because they didn't think they could get enough trash to make it profitable. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked them, I said, seriously? I mean, you, and they said, well, Casella has contracts with all of our haulers, and we weren't sure that we'd be able to get it. I thought that was a little disingenuous. I think they're pretty happy sending it to Cobb. That's what I think is really happy. So, um, in that same newspaper, there was an EPA article about the $19 million that the state of Vermont is getting from the federal government for clean water. Um, and in that, they said they need to build greener wastewater treatment plants and deal with the arsenic, lead, and other chemicals that affect people's homes. So there's an admission right there that it's a problem. Current groundwater, this is in that article, Current, currently the groundwater samples Below Casella's landfill has tested high and in exceedance of standards at two specific sections of the landfill, not just one, two. 
So, um, here's what we know. PFAS and the groundwater sampling from the Department of Environmental Conversation, Conservation Report, 910. I sent all of you guys all of these test results and all of these reports. Um, probably 10,000 pages worth of stuff, but I tried to pull out the stuff that was pertinent. <coughs> Um, in that, it says the on-the-line portion of the landfill is migrating. I'll try not to use leak, but to me that's the same. And the PFAS level there was 116 parts per trillion. 20 is the standard guideline. Of, of that 116 parts, 57 parts per trillion of that is PFOA, which is the stuff that Bennington is dealing with now. All of their wells are being closed. Um, so, um, you know, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go back here. And how do I know that? Because they've all admitted. So we have a report. I sent you the report. It shows where the, where the amounts are. Um, what else do we know? One of the line landfills, the groundwater um, down gradient, which means next to, below it, whatever, sh uh, showed up at 6.7 parts per trillion in the groundwater. Um, so there's, there's stuff coming from that too. Um, they, they can't definitely say that it's coming from there, but seeing that the leachate that's in there is at um, 10,000 parts per trillion in one of the other tests that we have, um, I guess it would be safe to say that's probably where it's coming from. They haven't done a test to, to decide that yet. So, but they do know that it's in the, it's in the ground. Um, my problem with part of that is they're not going to do anything about the netto for 20 years. That's, that's coming out. If you watch the Channel 3, I had them span from my house, from the landfill to the water. You're, a, you're an eighth of a mile, maybe less. It's right on top of the Black River. The Black River comes in right by where your well is for the, for the city. So if it's in the groundwater there, just a matter of time. If they're going to wait 20 years. It's just a matter of time before it's going to be in your water. Nobody knows. And everything that I'm going to show you, read from you from now on, I'm going to try to keep it relatively short. Everybody I've talked to, this is a, an emerging um, contaminant, and they just don't know. And that's what bugs me. They don't know yet. They gave them a permit in this. The effluent treated from Newport was tested. The effluent from, the, from your plant, that's the water coming out of it after it's been treated, um, was tested by, by two different meth methods. And one of them, the PFOA parts per trillion, directly in the leachate was 1,850 parts per trillion. What's the acceptable standard, Charlie? 20. 20 well, 20, 20 is in the drinking water, so that, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll try to explain that. In the second test, it was 2,204. But you'll explain the whole range and what that means. What they do, what they do is they take that 20 parts per is, is from what they test downstream of that. So that stuff that you're pour into the river, goes into the river, and downstream for that, they take a sample of it. So down gradient of that, it's 20 parts per trillion is allowed. And, and, and I don't think it's tested higher than that. Um, I'm not sure they have tested it. I, I haven't seen their results. But the theory there is um, um, dilution is the solution to pollution. The problem is PFAS, are non-soluble. They don't dissolve. So they stay in there and they just keep accumulating. That's why these people have a problem with it because it doesn't go away. It just, it just keeps building up and building up. They don't know the effects of it. So, um, the Agency of Natural Resources, I've contacted several of them and the Department of Environmental Conservation, will tell you that wastewater treatment plants are not able to treat PFAS. Um, uh, the leachate. 
but it flat out come out and tell you that not airborne. Of, of um, there was a ground router analysis done by Mr. Uh, Heindel, who I think was here tonight, that had said that arsenic, iron, lead, and manganese levels statisti statistically exceed groundwater standards in many of the upgrading and downgrading wells in Covington. For instance, arsenic, 49 parts per billion, standard is 10. Lead, 57 parts per billion, standard is 15. Chromium, 150 parts per billion, standard is 100. Nickel, 230 parts per billion, standard is 100. So it's high everywhere. This was in his report. Um, so uh, the, the report says the exceedances are, in the same report, likely the result of migration of leachate from the online land, which they're not going to fix for 20 years. Um, and they are also in the leachate that you're treating. So, a um, couple of things in the permit. Now, they send out the permit. I don't know if you guys looked at the thing. It was like 15 different categories and 5,000 pages. Um, but at the end, they do it. Basically, it's a conclusionary thing, and they put a lot of information in there. And these are just some of the excerpts from it. And this is from Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. They just printed it off the site. So, um, Coventry Landfill Pre-Treatment Discharge, which is another permit that they're going to go for. Um, certification utilizing PFAS concentrations measured at the Newport Wastewater Treatment Facility. The Department of Environmental Conservation has calculated likely receiving water concentrations of PFAS downstream of the Newport Wastewater Treatment Plant within the Clyde River. So they have been detected. The D Department of the DEC has concluded additional evaluation of landfill operations and leachate management is appropriate to minimize potential impact on the local receiving water. So they're, they're saying they need more, more evaluation because they don't know anything about it. You'll find that all, all the way through their things. Um, Coventry will manage landfill operations to promote reduction in leaching. Reasoning, the primary goal of landfill infrastructure is to minimize the leachage production and that may serve to reduce the total amount of PFAS that need to be managed within the leaching. May also serve. It's an ongoing study, they don't know, they don't know for sure. Um, they are, they are going to ask, uh, which again I have a problem with, uh, Casella's <coughs> will conduct a study of PFAAs and the waste being disposed of at the landfill and the treatment options for leachate. Basically I'm saying the permittee, which would be Casella's, to develop a sampling plan which will identify waste streams that have potential high levels of PFAS and evaluate the range of PFA concentration in these waters. Furthermore, goes on to say this evaluation will guide the DEC's work in evaluating potential waste sources for which treatment to or at disposal may be appropriate. So again, they're saying, we're going to let them test it, check it out, because we don't know. So again, that's another we don't know. And this is all from that permit. The DEC will conduct a more detailed investigation in the concentration of PFAS in Vermont's leachate influent and effluent from wastewater treatment plants and surface water. Further evaluation is needed to better understand the fate and transport of PFAS from landfill leachate as it is processed through wastewater treatment plants. <laughs> it makes you feel fairly confident, doesn't it? Further, further evaluation is needed to better understand it. They don't know. They don't know. The DEC will evaluate existing information and treatment um, containing waste prior to and at the point of landfill disposal. Reasoning, there may be options for managing PFAS containing waste which can reduce the release of PFAS to the landfill leachate and therefore potential for environmental release. So what they're saying there is when it's in the leachate, it has the potential for environmental release. Not just the potential, it's happening when you do it. Um, PFAS is an emerging contaminant and is a growing concern for all states and the Environmental Protection Agency. 
There are a number of states are actively in the process of requesting landfill leachate, wastewater treatment sampling and investigation, and finding out what the appropriate steps are to address this issue. So again, they don't know. Everywhere along here, they, they, they don't know the answer. The FAS has been described as emerging contaminants, compounds that are, occur wildly, wide, widely in the environment, but for which only minimal data is available to assess their risk. The FAAs have been of greater regulatory concern in Vermont since 2016 discovery of the PFAS problem in Bennington. Evaluation of health and ecological impacts are taken on a chemical by chemical approach with significant resources being expended to develop necessary toxicology information needed to adopt regulatory standards. But they don't have it because they don't know. They're still going to test. Beyond human health, the evaluation of potential ecological impacts of PFAS on natural communities has been even more limited. So they know even less about the accumulation of it once it's, once it's deposited. PFAS and water treatment facilities. This is in the Agency of Natural Resources release. Conventional wastewater treatment facility processes do not efficiently remove PFAS. Wastewater treatment processes can lead to physical and chemical partitioning of various PFA compounds into either the treated liquid, F1, or into the solids, sludges, which then may serve as sources of PFAS to, to enter the environment. This is in their permit. So they, they're giving a permit, explaining that they don't even know what's talking about. So, there are a lot of places that can take the lead to. One of the questions in here was, which wastewater treatment plants receive leachate? Has there ever been a problem? To the second portion of that, there is no answer in this. In this. They didn't answer whether there's ever been a problem. But the facilities that are currently available are Montpelier, Essex Junction, the city of Barrie, Burlington, the city of Newport, Concord, New Hampshire, and Plattsburgh, New York. What I want is for all of it to go to all of them except Newport City. Could you repeat that, Charlie? What you want? Excuse me, please address me. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. So what we want is for them to take it all, not for Newport to take none. Thank um, you. Furthermore, and I'm almost done, <laughs> um, Senator Bray, Chris Bray, who is the chairman of the Senate Natural Resources uh, Committee for the State of Vermont, has also been involved in this. He's very alarmed because it's not just affecting Newport. It's affecting the Dog River, the Winooski, the Onion, it all dumps into Champlain. Stuff from Plattsburgh is going into Champlain. Lake Champlain is also receiving all of this stuff. And he, he's, he's pretty upset. He sent all kinds of questions to the Department of Environmental Conservation. One of them, I have a basic question. Are wastewater treatment plants designed to remove, remove <coughs> PFOAs? Answer, water treatment facilities are not specifically designed to remove this. That's from the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, currently, wastewater treatment facilities have no obligation to monitor or treat PFAs compounds. The state does, this, this is the answer from the state. The state does not have a standard for PFAS compounds in surface water, which is what happens when it comes out. It goes on and on and on. I have all the test results. His comment sent me an email <coughs> after the decision was made. This is his comment. This was the most irresponsible action I've seen while in government. And prior to the election, while politicians are especially sensitive to public issues, I plan to make this an issue. If re-elected, I am moving this issue to the top of my list because government needs to adopt a precautionary approach to the issue of citizens being exposed to toxins. Anything else leaves all of us as guinea pigs who must first become sick in sufficient numbers to draw a governmental response. Just as we saw in Bennington with the PFOA poisoning that took place. I am committed to this work and I thank you for all your hard work. So, <laughs> as a re as this permit has required Casella to do a couple of things, so we managed to get a couple of uh, 
issues on the table. I mean, we're not happy with, with the later permit. Two of the things are they're going to have to, the seller must do a semi annual, annual twice a year, monitoring of PFAAs in the groundwater under drains and the leakage. The seller must do it. Not the state of the month, not going to do it. The seller must do it. Number two, the seller must, again, conduct investigative evaluation to on site, to off site le leachate treatment uh, options and submit to the Agency of Natural Resources by the end of October 2019. So, they gave them the permit. Everything that I just read to you came right from them, saying they don't know what the hell's in there. <laughs> PFOAs, we all know, is dangerous. Um, Sala's not doing anything wrong because they have, they, they've got a permit to do it. You're not doing anything wrong because your wastewater treatment plant is permitted to do it. When I asked the state of Vermont what the rush was, when you, when you tell me that you have no idea what the effect, the long-range effect are of these chemicals, other than Bennington's idea, where we all know it was really bad, and you don't know how to treat it, you don't know how to dispose of it, you don't know how to deal with it, why the hell did you give them a permit until you know the answer? And he said, contamination was not a consideration in this permit. That goes to the Act 250 board, the wastewater disposal, there's a couple others. So there's all these departments within the state, and one just passed the buck off the deal. So here's what we want. <clears throat> Dump, Memphis Magog, conservation. We want you to stop taking leachate immediately from the Newport Wastewater Treatment Plant. We would like to see a motion and a vote on it. We want to know what your stance is on it. Until they can prove to you that it's perfectly safe. All the tests have been done and everything is fine. That's what we want. Number two, my group and a couple of the other groups that we are aligned with for the Act 250 permit, we'd love to have the city of Newport take a stance that they do not approve this expansion until, uh, once again, there is proof that it's not ever going to harm this lake and our people. There are other reasons other than that for you guys not to do it. The odor, the, the air quality, the traffic your water supply. There's a lot of reasons that you could get on board with us. And I'm just saying, I would like a motion from you, a stance, saying, we, we, ex we oppose this until these tests have been done, and they know what to do, and they have a proper way to treat it. So that's my presentation, and thank you very much for this. Questions? Council members, before I open it up to the floor, because I said I would let people. Anybody? Anything? What you think of right now? Are they mandated to treat the leachate? The cellar? I know they pull it out at the landfill. Like if they're told, you don't, we don't want it to be treated at our wastewater plant. Do they still have to treat the leachates, or will they just say, well, no, they we're not going to treat them? Well, they, no, they have to treat it. I mean, that's, I, I think that's part of their part of their permitting is that the leachate, is, 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 it's getting there. You can't just stay there forever. I mean, it's got to be pulled well, out there. Yeah, it, that's it's really going to be a problem. Yeah, it would have to go somewhere but, else. But, but that's why they have, that's why they have all those other... Places. Because you're only allowed to treat so much. I forget how many gallons are we allowed to treat right now? 15,000 gallons. 15, but you've, asked, you've asked for more, but correct? I saw a letter in May saying that you would, you would love to have more. We have not objected to our request to have more. Correct. Right. Yeah. And Casella is here, so Kevin's yeah. question might be better responded to by now. Right. Um, yeah, let's. Yeah, I have a question for um, 
I mean, I assume they have to have a place to get rid of it. Right. So we're going to let yeah, Casella's here to answer that. Um, and I'd like to have Casella address the 20-year time frame for the net old landfill that, it, that keeps coming up. If that is truly going to be 20 years before anything happens, or because that's the unlined landfill, that's the old landfill. And so if someone from Casella wish to be. Sure. Um, my name is Joe Gay. I'm an engineer with Casella. Um, Kevin, to answer your question, uh, we are required by this permit that we're talking about um, to have a permitted disposal location for our leaching. Um, so we have multiple uh, wastewater treatment plants that we've permitted. Um, in the event that you know one goes through an upgrade, we can go to another. For instance, Montpelier just went through an upgrade and we took the leachate to other wastewater treatment plants while they were going through that upgrade. So there's some flexibility in the permit and it allows us to go to other options. Um, so yes, it is a permit requirement. We do have to take it. Um, as far as a 20-year uh, Phase 5 project, uh, so I think I'm getting a pretty ringing endorsement for Phase 5, um, <laughs> uh, at least from what I'm hearing. So, uh, so with Phase 6, uh, that's permitted for 22 to 25 years. Um, we're on a four-year permitting track for phase six, which is the permitting we're currently going through. So we started three years ago permitting phase six. So we think it's going to take four years um, to permit phase five when that, when that time frame comes. Um, and if we're at capacity in 22 years, we would start permitting in 18 years. So close. 20 years rounded up, but about 18 years from now. We would have capacity through to, you know, 18 years from now and we'd begin to look at the permitting for phase five in about 18 years. Um, any council, the other council members before I let people from the audience? Uh, this time. Can, can I make a comment on the mm -hmm. uh, treatment of leachate? If everybody decided not to take their leachate, that, that would be a, a, a really big problem. And that, that may be, um, I mean, that may happen down the road. Once it starts, it begins to snow. Um, from what I've read, <clears throat> I probably read um, 10 or 20,000 pages worth of all kinds of stuff really. From what I've read, there are pre-treatment options that they could build on site. They're pretty expensive. There are, are carbon uh, pre-treatment facilities that actually can do a fairly good job with PFOAs until the carbon doesn't work anymore and then they have to redo it. So there, there are other options where they, if, if all of that happened, they may be forced, they'd have to build one on their site. You know. They do that in other areas of the country. The carbon is like a big filtration. No, it works, work, it works yeah. for a while until right. it doesn't work. And then it, yeah. I know, I think one of my concerns is the PFAS, that yeah. aspect being so new. And after reading what happened in Benjamin and that whole area, that, I mean, I know when that first hit the news, I asked the city manager if we had done testing of our water coming from the well, just to make sure, because we didn't know with everything. And that test, that is, and I don't want to interrupt you, but that is a particular test. So your test that goes out for lead, arsenic, and all that's not going to show you. You have to do a special Right. Test. I, that's my concern with, um, with us taking more, you know, or expanding is that unknown right. chemical that is so new and um, it's been a concern of mine from basically since it affected the Bennington water. Um, May I just had, had Mr. Mayor, if your well ever get contaminated, <coughs> you may have to pump your water like other cities do in Quebec from the lake. And if at the same time, if you have polluted the lake, you have no fallback position. The well will be polluted and the bay will be polluted. So that's why. We're not just asking for Canadian, we're asking for American. Be very careful before you discharge anything on the lake. Yeah, um, 
this would go back to probably when you, Charlie, or, or Dan, um, when this came up originally, or even Mr. Game right now, is there a contract that says that the city of Newport has to take the Chief to treat it? Is that ever? We do have a permit, and the permit allows 15,000 gallons a day. Right. And if we have um, reason to believe we'd like that to suspend, then of course Casella would cooperate with that. Okay. So there's no contract that says you must take it. Um, I don't it's only a said. permit that says you can take this. We are, we are permitted for that. The uh, when I was, uh, I can go back to answer part of your question. I was on. Uh, Dan was after me, so I was mayor when the solid waste division was originally talking, and it wasn't not Casella, I think it was Waste USA, or, mm -hmm. or, um, of putting the baggies, is what I called them, into the landfill. Um, one of my questions at the time was, um, and I guess they've changed their opinion on this, but I said, what's the life expectancy of these? And they said 20 years. So what are you going to do in 20 years? And they said, well, we'll have it all figured out, <laughs> so we don't have to worry about it. <coughs> um, I opposed it. Um, I was probably the lone person out there arguing about it because everybody in the solid waste district wanted a place to put their garbage and they were going to close all the landfills. So they scared the hell out of everybody, saying that your open landfill is not going to work anymore. You're going to have to do this. And the cheapest way to do it is for everybody to get together and go over and do it. So that's what we did. I was promoting, promoting incineration, recycling back then. My wife and I have been recycling for 22 years. Feel it's, about it. it's just, you know, stay or watch, really slow catching up. But, um, so, and there was no contract, there was no talk about leach, uh, the leachate for the most part. Nobody knew what the hell it was. So, and then later on, I don't know. <coughs> well, my, my uh, role, I was on the council at the time, but at the same time I was working for Johnson Engineering. And I was negotiating with Charlie Netto, and we were developing a plan for Waste USA. And at the same time, statewide, all districts are supposed to be planning for a landfill for their district. So if we had a landfill in every district, we'd never have what we have today. I mean, today, is a, to me, is a monstrosity. Right. You know, it's just uh, too big. And again, it goes back to the state not doing their job. All right. So later on, I think initially, you know, they talked that uh, the initial le leachate would be back, put back on top, filtrate back down through, and eventually the leachate would have to go somewhere. So the people from Waste USA came and asked the council if uh, we could take leachate. Well, at the time we were doing injection. We used to have a machine. We used to do the cornfield down on Scotts and several places. Now my concern was always, what happens if we take the leachate as a hot spot at our facility? Mm -hmm. That means that we've got to dewater and, uh, and and landfill it, you know, landfill that product. So at the time, I didn't want to take the leachate, and I probably I was on the on the edge, except the gentleman that came to explain everything he got mad at us and said. Well, we can take it other places for the same price, <laughs> which was a bad thing to say because if you can take it someplace else for the same price, take it there. And I've always had a concern about hot spots in our facility back then. And I even had concerns about a hot spot when we had to build an arsenic facility. So I've never really trusted the landfill. And it's not just Waste USA at the same time I was working on Palisades. And Palisades was having, they were having an odor problem. They were having a dust problem because they got their cover from on site. So for me, if you've got a double line, if that means one's going to fail sooner or later, which means probably the second one's going to fail sooner or later. So what did you say? Yep. Well, the, other, the other part of that is, when we were here the last time, they were talking about welding 
you know, you don't have to worry about it if it leaks because we can weld it. And we did that in Bethlehem, New Hampshire. And I don't know if you remember that conversation. Three days later, I get a thing from um, a concerned citizen telling me that they're being sued for a violation of the Clean Water Act in Bethlehem, New Hampshire, and that they have agreed to close the flame field. I assume they're going to bring it here. But, well, so. Well, they do leak. Can we ask if that's accurate? Sure. I have a. That's not accurate. Not even close to being accurate. I have. Yeah. Um, we are being sued by Conservation Law Foundation and Toxics Action Center um, for what, what would be Phase Five here. An online landfill was removed at the site. Um, the online landfill was placed in a line landfill because okay, this was before Casella on the site because there was a groundwater seep on an embankment to a river, and there was leaching from the landfill, draining out of the embankment, down a drainage channel, and into the Amonesic River. No question of environmental nightmare. The owners at the time, the state of New Hampshire, said, you need to remediate that. So the owners said, well, we think the best thing to do is to take the waste from the online landfill, contaminated groundwater, contaminated soil, the same thing that phase five is, and move it into a line landfill, remove the source, clean up the environment, and over time that seep will clean up. And that's exactly what happened. Um, in 2010, the contamination was gone except surface water exceedances for iron and manganese. All the volatile organic compounds and all the, the things in the typical leachate were gone. Okay, the state of New Hampshire came to, at this time now we own the landfill, the state of New Hampshire came to us and said there's one more chapter to be written, and that is an aesthetic remediation. So at the seat, there was orange staining where it came out of the embankment going down the drainage channel to the river. We want you to clean that up, restore it to what it once was, um, and then the remediation is considered complete, 100%. We did that in 2010. Great story for the environment. Environment's cleaned up. Toxics Action Center um, and Conservation Law Foundation is suing us today, started in March, actually, this year, claiming that we created the drainage channel. Um, that's the lawsuit. It has nothing to do with the liner systems at all. So that is incorrect. And I think, just to clarify, he clarified the comment about welding it to fix it. They didn't weld it to fix it, they welded it to put two, two zones together. Yeah. This is, this is the way he explained it. So there, there's... I, I don't believe a success story is what he's talking about. I don't consider that a success story. No. Because it was an issue first. We were trying to eliminate the issue first. Okay, I want to open it up to... The, to um, and Anne had her hand up. Anne had her hand, then we'll go to Beth after. What about the list? What? The list of people? Oh. oh. Yeah. On Anne's on the top of the list. No, <laughs> no don't worry, I hadn't forgot the list either. Okay. If anybody raises their hand, I'm going to let speak for this to see who Hi, I'm Anne Shirello, and I'm a resident of Newport. Um, and I also. Um, want the council to do the two-pronged approach. Um, and I just add a few things with respect to it. The first prong is for us to stop um, taking leachate um, and to stop admitting what comes out of the leachate into the lake. Um, I know that is going to cost you, or cost the city, $180,000 that you are now getting uh, from the dump, but it is well worth it for us taxpayers to pay $180,000 up front um, than to have a contaminated lake out there where your property values go down enormously, where no one wants to live here, and uh, you don't have a four season recreation situation because you have a lake that's dead. Um, number two, you know, PFOAs are a dangerous thing, a thing that we have to worry about now. How many other things in the past, like Teflon, which we thought was a great thing, 
and the PFOA um, uh, company uh, that was using PFOAs uh, in Bennington, which I'm sure they thought at that time was a great thing, and which closed 12 years ago. And then they find out, they're surprised that it's moved. It moved all the way from where the company was, the PFOAs, by groundwater and through, um, I assume, underground lakes and underground streams, much further than they ever expected it to move. And now they've got to uh, repipe a, a large portion of Bennington. I'm sure it did wonders for their property values, if you want to be practical about it. Um, so let's stop it now. There are things coming down the line that are in the, the uh, garbage that's coming there that we don't even know about yet because we've been experimenting with all the things that we thought were good that turn out to be dangerous to our health. So stop putting leachate through our uh, waste management plant to begin with. Um, you know, our well is less than a mile, our two wells are less than a mile away from the dump. How long is it going to take with the way underground streams move different ways to, to reach our well and then we've got a contaminated well and then what's our property values worth then? Um, the other things I'd like to point out is we enable, when we take leachate we enable them to continue doing things, Casella, and the state. Because after all, we're the only dump left right now. They'll continue to dump on the Northeast Kingdom as long as they possibly can until we push back. What's our pushback? Stop taking leachate. You want to you wanna see how long Burlington and Montpelier are going to want to take leachate and contaminate their rivers? or lakes. Not long. Not long. And yeah, you may reach a point where nobody wants leachate. And then Casella's going to have to think, or some other um, facility, or the state, is going to have to think of other ways to dispose of waste. But if we can take the leachate, there's no impetus for them to start thinking of new ways to do things. The second thing I want to uh, talk about is the second aspect of what Charlie mentioned, which is, what should you do about uh, curtailing Casella? Well, one is, an Act 250 hearing is coming up, and maybe because we were so distracted with the hole and all of that stuff, we, we weren't watching what they were doing, and we weren't watching while they closed all the other um, facilities around the state so that we're the only dump. But now, even if it's too late for you even to become a party, and I think you should still try to be a party to the Act 250 by asking belatedly to be a party, no matter what, you can be a friend, you can go in and ask to be a friend um, of the committee that's making the Act 250 decision, and you can explain to them why they should not be allowed to expand. If you allow them to expand, again, there's no impetus for the state or Casella to do anything else but expand. It's great, they got another 20 years. So nobody has to think about, well, what else are we going to do with all of this waste? So how long do we want to be the dumping ground for the state of Vermont, <laughs> New Jersey, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York? You got the picture. Please. I get a lot of other people. Uh, and write letters. Write letters to our governor and write letters to our senators and representatives and tell them we don't want to be the dumping ground for all of the garbage in Vermont and elsewhere. <laughs> okay, um, next on this, well, I'll go to Beth and then because then I'll go down to Pam after. Um, Beth Barnes, Newport, but I've recently moved back from Williston where I was living with my boyfriend. Uh, that is important to the story. I was uh, kayaking with him this summer on the Black River, and he reassured me that the landfill did not leak. It was all a bunch of hype, and we were all worried about nothing up here. What's interesting about that story is that he is the managing partner of Gravel and Shea, 
which is the law firm in Burlington that represents Casella, although Bob does not represent it directly. His fellow partner, Tim Eustace, spends a lot of time there. Um, is he right? Does it not, does it not leak? Or is it just a bunch of hype or a bunch of, of country pumpkins in the NEK, which is the way he made me feel? Um, so anyway, Bob Rushford, managing partner for Bell and Shea. I don't know if that was true, but he told me that the landfill does not leak. Um, also, I find it really interesting about Williston and that they did not want, or that they said that there was not enough trash to dump down there. Well, I'm here to tell you that at least four of the managing partners at Gravel and Shea live in Williston, as does the, the office manager, Bob Rushford, who is the managing partner, Tim Eustace, they live in Williston. Of course, they don't want it in their backyard when they can ship it off to the NEK. Another interesting fact is that each attorney um, at Gravel and Shea needs to do pro bono work. Um, the managing partner, my former boyfriend, Bob Rushford, represents, <laughs> yes, just for the record again, represents the South Hero Watershed Association, and he helps them clean up the water in Lake Champlain. While we up here are dealing with this catastrophe, he's down there doing pro bono work to help them clean up Lake Champagne. Plain. None of it makes sense to me. Sorry. I just had to share those little snippets. None of it makes sense. He's cleaning up their water while the rest of us are drowning in poison up here. Um, Pam, it's, it's been covered. It's been covered. Sue Watson. <coughs> Susan Watson Susan, from yeah. well, and from Spruce Street in Newport. I've been reading a lot about the uh, potential of PFAS, PFAS and PFOA and leachate getting into the groundwater in Newport which to me just feeds right into our drinking water. And I've been really curious and concerned why uh, the Newport City Administrative and Council Group seems to be unconcerned about the Newport drinking water. Well, it's understandable. Vermont Heritage is providing them with water so they don't have to drink the city water. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to comment on that one. That doesn't even deserve a comment. We are very concerned about our drinking water. We test the water. We we had to spend three million, I don't know how many million, on a treatment plant because to treat the water. And so we're very concerned about our well water, and we test it. Just because we have a water cooler from Mont, Mont Heritage doesn't mean we don't trust our own water. That is a complete, <laughs> well, utter nonsense. No, well, That's my only editorial obvious. comment on that. No, we're going to, let me get, let me let everyone oh, else speak. No, I have Jay Walsh next. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jay Walsh. I'm a new resident to Newport, uh, two years. I have a wife here and uh, two small children that uh, go to school here. Well, I hope we're going to be able to enjoy this lake uh, throughout their lifetime and return from college uh, to live here and raise their own children. Um, I fear that that is not going to be possible if we continue to uh, dump this uh, PFOA um, and contaminants from the lake shape through the uh, wastewater treatment facility, which is woefully um, unprepared to treat that uh, effectively. I've been doing a lot of uh, the research for Charlie and, and uh, the dump group, and you know it, it, it's surprising that, that the state doesn't seem to know what to do with this uh, or that it will contaminate um, you know, the, the health of our uh, residents because um, I've reviewed over, in the last three weeks, I've reviewed over 75 health studies from around the world by the EPA, the Department of Health, the World Health Organization, studies from uh, Japan, China, Europe, Korea, Australia, they're all dealing with these chemicals. They are pervasive throughout our entire world. PFOAs are not just, or any one of those classifications, PFOS, PFOA, uh, it's not one chemical. 
it's a series of thousands of chemicals. Okay, this is toxic soup that is coming into this land, uh, this uh, water treatment facility. Uh, there are a group of synthetic com compounds containing thousands of chemicals persistent in the environment and have shown the ability to bioaccumulate. That means that they do not dissipate in, in our wildlife or in our organs. They accumulate. Uh, also in the plant soils and um, uh, the sediment in the lake. So it is going to be there forever. The compounds are biologically and chemically stable in the environment, meaning that they tend to resist any degradation processes at all. They will not go away. They are not being diluted by this, the hundreds of millions of, of uh, gallons in this lake. They are still concentrated. I've looked at these studies on the health effects of water and the sediment surrounding <coughs> soils, plants, organisms, vertebrates, fish, waterfowl, and humans, and none of them describes safe for humans in any level. The standards for the release to the environment are only assumptions. They do not know. These are what they term accept acceptable exposure risks. Okay? Some of these health risks are pregnancy-induced hypertension uh, and preeclampsia uh, for women, liver damage, increased cholesterol and low density uh, cholesterol levels, increased thyroid disease, uh, decreased antibody response to vaccines, increased risk of asthma, increased risk and decreased fertility and testosterone, decreases in birth weight, birth, birth, excuse me, brain development uh, effects and the half-life of this in humans for PFOA is eight years. That's not. That's if you're not reintroduced uh, it, uh, into your system again. Okay, and this can be absorbed through the skin or it can be ingested. For PFOS, it's five and a half years. Okay. <coughs> Once in the lake, these toxins are going to be there for good. There is no cleanup solution. We know this from the Hudson River and the Housatonic River in, in the Berkshires in New York uh, from GE. There's hundreds of millions of pounds of chemicals, uh, PF, uh, PC, PFCs that uh, were disposed of by GE, which also uh, uh, poisoned the, the city that I grew up in. The city I grew up in was Fitchburg, Massachusetts. The river that runs through that was a different color every single day from uh, the disposal of tanneries and um, paper manufacturing. And then GE decided to come in because it was an open sewer. Let's dump in it. It took the, the heroic efforts of one woman to clean that up. It took her 30 years to do it. It's now one of the most pristine lake, uh, rivers in the country. I just want to see my kids grow up here. I love it here. Only haven't been here two years. We have had a practice here for four years, and so we've been coming back and forth here. Um, I hope that you take action, stop taking the le leachate. It is the most direct route for these chemicals to get into this lake. We are going to be faced with the, the leaching of it from the landfill eventually, uh, if it isn't already, but that's a slower process than us taking it straight to the lake. Thank you for your time. Uh, with the exception of the guys from Casella that I talked to two or three weeks ago, I've not talked to one individual. Trust me, I've got a million phone calls and probably seven million emails. <laughs> that is in favor of this. Not one. Nobody. So um, what I'm what I'm asking again. And the, the first, the, the leachate part is easy. You can control it. The rest of it, you really can't control. What you can do, the reason I asked you to take a stance on the expansion is because <clears throat> although you can't get Act 250 status, I believe we will have it. <coughs> and if we don't have it, because Casella's lawyers are trying to stop us from mm -hmm. having it, mm -hmm. so you know. Um, and um, we have other agencies 
that will fight if, if we can't get it, that our party status. And a letter from you, or a statement from you, saying that until they can prove that everything is safe and there's no possible contamination and no problems, that you oppose it. Not asking you to oppose it for no, no reason. The neighbors in Irisburg will love you for it. The neighbors in Coventry, no, probably not Coventry. Although, I haven't talked with anybody from Coventry that's in favor of it. So, um, but all of the roads entering in here, and we will have shortly a study of how many trucks are coming on what roads every day, and it's astronomical. And our, our taxes are, are paying for that. Um, all of these things together at Act 250 can get us to stop it. They, they, they're closing the one in Bethlehem, New Hampshire. They can damn well close this one too. Find another place for it. You hit, okay, you hit one of my concerns that I was sh actually shocked to find out that the state had no planning. So that's why they zero. They have zero planning. That even came from representatives from the state. Casella uh, is their point. Well, that's what I'm getting at. They had no plan for after 20 years. The state of Vermont had absolutely no planning. They planned for nothing after 20 or 22 years, which actually that surprised me. But then again, it didn't surprise me. Um, and I know the perfectly proposed happy. landfill and another reason why the landfill in Williston never got open. That was fought for years, and then all of a sudden they built these nice homes near it. Mm -hmm. You know. The developer didn't tell the folks there was a landfill potentially, and they built all these nice homes around it. So then of course the people didn't want a landfill there. Um, that I do know also. Um, my biggest thing again comes back to the PF, PFOAs or PFAs, how you say it. It's so new, the issue. Um, that's been my concern ever since it came out in the news in Bennington. You know, because too often in the world of environment or health. They wait until they wait 20 years until they see people passing away or, um, and, you know, getting cancer down the road. And then they do studies, well, why is there a cancer, why is there a high level of cancer in this area versus other areas? Um, and that, then they do studies to figure out why. And then they determine it was, well, the air or the water or the air, whatever. And so that's my biggest thing is that aspect, being so new in the state, not even being prepared for the testing. I mean, if, if our plant could treat it and we knew 100% that it, that it was taking out all the, the heavy metals and the PFAs and all that, I'd be more comfortable. But I know I expressed that concern to a couple people with the state saying, we don't know because you're not really testing. How do we test? Well, that's the issue. If we can't test for it, how do we know what we're putting in the water? Right. See, that's my concern. We could, be, and I've told you that. You know, I've expressed that to you. And like I already, I already actually told the manager too. Money is not everything to me. Granted, one hundred eighty-five thousand divided by all our water customers. That's what the rates will go up. It's going to end up being about. I'm going to guess four cents a bill. Four Excuse cents. Me, so four. four cents a bill. Four cents, oh no, yeah. mean four cents increase, per, increase. If you do the oh, per, per gallon, four cents per gallon. No, on each person's tax bill, you're going to have to make up that revenue. This is water, this is not taxes. Yeah. No, this is, this is utilities, I'm talking utilities. Yeah, but utilities isn't taxes, utilities is water and sewer. Right. So, right, so, so everybody gets a bill right now, and their bill is going to increase. Okay. If you do the math, their bill should be expected to increase four to five cents. I'm not sure if that's a quarter or a year, so please. <laughs> no, four or five cents. Well, no, 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 no. But you're saying four or five cents. Are you saying per gallon? See, it's different. We're not talking taxes. You're talking about the bill that you are assessed. Per quarter. Right. Not your tax bill, but the water and sewer. Exactly. So if you're saying, but I need to know, is that four cents times what? Is it, Jim, do you know offhand? Is it four yeah, cents between a quarter? between 1,600 and 1,700 customers. So you're going to have to make that up. All right, so I'm going to take 185,000 divided by just roughly yeah. 1,600. Yeah. Divide by four. Yeah. It's four quarters. So it would go up around $29 a quarter. There you go. That's a lot. 
that's so long. That's, yeah, that's oh, no, I'm just, I'm just trying to do math. No, no, let me finish my thought process. I'm trying to do the math just so that we can tell people that, if, you know, if we, if we don't do the 185000 this is what your bills will go up so that people are prepared. Um, I don't want all of a sudden to get my phone ringing saying, well, how come my water bill jumped $29 a quarter? And that's what will happen to the council. We've got, I'm just trying to be proactive here. And I had the 185 in my little calculator, and that's what I was trying to figure out. I took 185,000 divided by 1,600 divided by four, because we bill four quarters, and it came to 28.90, not 28 dollars and 91 cents. So that's important data. The <coughs> other piece of data, and now this is going to irritate everybody too, but I, I have an obligation. My role requires me to remind you of this. Everything that we're testing for right now, we are in compliance. That document right there is the results of the wet test. And I posted that on our website today. It's just come in. The state has a copy of that. Yeah. Can yeah. I have a copy? Yeah, yeah, and you can print it from our website. Thank you very much, yeah. Madam. Yeah, it's it's there under reports and studies. And my understanding from the state is that they need to spend more time with it. So um, what I want, what I want you to, you can have it. It's on our website. It's about. Okay, I'll look it up. You can print it. You can have that one too. I just yeah. printed out three because I can it's read it. The wet test is insignificant. Just want you to know that it's there. Does not test for PFOAs. Does not test for PFAS. And this and the stuff that we've been nothing. required to do, we we are in compliance. So I think that's important for you to know, making any decisions going forward. Uh, we've always been in compliance. It is my intent to compliance. So as these new tests come out. We will be doing everything we can to stay as proactive as we can. It's not my intent to poison the rate. It's my intent to work with the system that we have in place and work with the state to make sure that we are doing exactly what our due diligence requires of us, which is to maintain an ethical standard of operation. But when it comes to testing, that's the gray area. I have, I have, no, a, I have your leach No, 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 let me finish my train of thought. That is, done. that is the gray area as far as keeping a lot of our standard because, yeah, you standard now, but the state standards may not take into account all these other things. And that's, that's my concern is the state standards or the national standards. Well, that happens. That's why you're, you you can't be out of compliance with something. Well, but that is, happened with. But there is um, no standard. Well, a good example of that. <laughs> let me finish, please. A good I'm, example. I'm a good no, A good example is our water treatment plant. Used to be the national standard was 50 parts per billion. Okay. They do 15. It's no, it's 15. Is it 10 now? It's 10. Oh, then they lowered it even more because it went. It's always been 10. Oh, it hasn't been. Okay, they went from 50 based upon test and whatever. But that took a long time for them to determine that. Um, we were at what pay though before we built the plant? 15, 15 or we were at 1415, whatever. We were almost there. But we still we had to build a plant because they lowered the stand. My concern is with the, with this new chemical that's really becoming does the state really have the ability they don't you know what I mean? that's my big concern. Can I just make a comment on it? Because first of all, you said we haven't done a test; they don't know what's in the leaching. You guys, I sent this all to you guys. It's hard to read this stuff unless you do it. Then. But everywhere in the bowl, Newport is the news. Vermont is Newport. That's it's common. And everywhere in the bold lettering, which is most everywhere here, is where they it was detected above the reporting limits. Everywhere. The problem is that they don't, they, and which is what my whole spiel was before, they have no idea where the standards should be, what to do. All I'm asking you, I, I hope I'm <laughs> about how much it's worth to us to continue to pollute the water. Because that's what I heard. And that is very yeah. distressing. Oh, no, I didn't mean to so, come across that way. So, I wanted but, to, let me put here is, I came across as saying let the, ta let the rate payers know. That's my own. I'm not. I'm not putting. I'm not trying to be. I'm not against whatever you're doing because of dollars. I was just trying to put it to the ratepayers, saying you can expect a twenty-eight dollar or twenty-nine dollar per quarter increase if we take action tonight or take action whatever. I was just trying to be proactive because too often 
we have taken actions when all of a sudden the rate payers don't fully understand and then our phones start ringing and they want to know. So I was just trying to be proactive. I wasn't trying to steer anyone saying, oh no, the money wise. I wasn't, I wasn't talking about your comment. Oh, okay. I thought you were for a second. I don't mean to be defensive. I, I just have a duty to notify. I we understand. Have to do this. I, understand. Yeah. I got a lot of hands up this, now. This so. is this is the chart. Yeah. Let me go to people. I've got Pam, Pam, then Beth, and then um, Jeff. Pam, I'm sorry, what's the city of Newport? I would bet if you ask Bennington right now, how they would have felt about a twenty-nine dollar increase per quarter for decent water, they would say, hell yes. But no, we're quibbling about, we're nickel and diming, and we have no idea of how this is going to impact on our health. It's okay, I mean, you can smirk, you're not drinking the water, Laura. Any parent here with kids is going to be concerned. We have no idea what this stuff is going to do. We do know what it's done in Bennington. Why are we worrying about what in the long term is peanuts? Why are we putting, holding the health of our own community and the health of Sherbrooke and other people who bring from the lake? We are holding them hostage. That's insane. Beth Farms again. Um, Mayor Manette, you just said something about the, um, the, the, all the building down in Williston and why they might not want the dump there. Well, um, another news flash, Gravel and Shea represents Snyder Homes, which is the developer who is developing everything there at Finney Crossing and Taft Corners. Connect the dots. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor, uh, I'm Jack Watson from Newport. And just to, so that the public has an idea of the scope of what we're taking, the leachate, correct me if I'm wrong, is the worst stuff that in that dump that migrates down to a certain point, they drain it off, and they truck it out. And how much do they truck out? 50, correct me if I'm wrong, 15,000 gallons a day? Is that right? Yeah, just, mm -hmm. just a new port. Mm -hmm. It's 12 a year. 15,000, that's like filling up the tanks in two gas stations in town. That's how much. Every single day, the worst stuff that that dump is giving off is coming here into our lake, and I don't care, you know, you're not sophisticated enough to treat it because you don't even know what it is. The state doesn't, at least. It's going in every single day, and that's unfair to the public and future generations in the city of Sherbrooke and all those people up there that use it for drinking water. We're shooting ourselves in the foot here. There's a gentleman yep. in the back. Hi. Yes. Colony Miller, Lindenville. Um, and I appreciate the, the, the moment to, to give some comments. Um, I've come up to this wonderful watershed and recreated here. And you folks, it's unbelievable the special resource you have here, the special water resource. Um, I've come up here, paddled on South Bay, um, done bird watching. Um, seen ospreys flying over and uh, other other water birds and it's just amazing and, and, and at the same time to me it's so incongruous that within a mile or two there's this egregious uh, full fill of, of all this waste material which which I think should be changed to reusables or recyclables or compostables because at the Gateway Center meeting the CLF attorney and I think she was being conservative stated that two-thirds of the material that's being shipped to the landfill could be either recycled or composted. That was a statewide average. And so, which and we are receiving, as Charlie has mentioned several times, and, and Anne, we are receiving this material from all over the state, which I find an, abom an abomination that you guys would let this go on up here. But um, especially when, I mean, you can just do simple mathematics, but as I understand it, it's a 51-acre proposed expansion well then, two thirds of 51. I just did the math a minute ago. It's 34 acres if, that we could accomplish just by removing those materials that could be recycled or composted. I was very disappointed at the meeting at the Gateway Center that, and I know I'm echoing some similar themes uh, about the the, the 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 downfall that the state has 
has done in terms of showing concern, appropriate <coughs> concern, and 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 the proper answers for this citing. But I brought, I, I spoke at that meeting, and I brought up the point that I and, and I and I motioned to the to the lady that was representing the solid waste program, and I said, is it true that it's about five hundred thousand dollars an acre to site a landfill, which in this case fifty one times five hundred thousand comes out to about. 25 million plus dollars, and she didn't have the answer. And I just, I went away from that meeting thinking, how could you not know that simple fundamental answer if you really care about the, the economic dynamics of what's going on here? So anyway, I'm just echoing the, the side of the recycling and the composting and all those materials that can go in. And by the way, also then that we now know that plastics have a tremendous number of endocrine disruptors. So it's not just the PFOAs, the PFASs, it's, it's, it's also these other items that are in plastics that can, can be washed through and, and leached down into, into the subsurface. But anyway, there's, it's a faulty system. The Casella guys are just trying to do their job um, and they're doing it to the best of their abilities. But it's all predicated on a faulty system. And, and, and the mayor, Paul, you've, you've echoed that sentiment that it's all based on a faulty system. Um, I can name three compounds in addition to what um, uh, Mr. Walsh. Mr. Walsh mentioned that the, the government let us down once again, but they're, they're lead, PCBs, and, and the third obvious, well, dioxins is another one, one of the most potent chemicals on, on, on earth. Um, and, 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 uh, the third one was, I wrote it down here, DDT. We all, some of, some of us may be old enough to remember when DDT was used, and the government actually approved and commissioned that, and let, and we still manufacture it in this country. We just ship it to other, we sell it to other countries. So I mean, it's just, a, it's an abomination. So it's all based on a faulty system, and we're all trying to work within this faulty system, but I, I, I was just very enthused to hear a lot of people punching through that faulty system and seeing all of it, so I wanted to just add to that. Thank you. I saw Jack, and then I'll go right to you after. I'm Jack Roberge. Actually, 25, almost 30 years ago, Dan, if you remember, I was president of the council uh, when UH USA came in with their grand proposal. How it was never good. It was always going to be just a smaller regional, uh, going to be a line cap landfill. Uh, it was never supposed to become what it is today. That was never the intention. Uh, we had a gentleman at the time, if you don't remember, Wayne Wheeler, advocated and advocated and advocated and warned us about this day. And we should have listened to him. So don't make the same mistake that we made. Stop it now when you can. Uh, we should have never let it happen. We should have listened to Dan and Wayne back then uh, and not let them do what they've done. Since then, I don't know why it's grown, why the past council have let it grow the way it has been, but you now have an opportunity to probably put a stop to it. So, you know, don't make the same mistake that we made 25 years ago. I'm Essie Brown. I live in Derby. I have lived in Newport, and I've had um, a couple of different properties in Newport. I've lived around the lake, uh, both sides. Um, I grew up as a child um, very close to the lake and went swimming most every day in the summer in the lake. I uh, took swimming lessons there. and. Um, at that time, it was not as clean as it got to be because of the treatment plant that was um, established here in Newport. Um, we won't talk about what was in the lake at that point. But, um, so things have gotten cleaner, but I am very concerned about the quality of the water in the lake. Um, I. Um, I wonder, you know, we talk about the amount of leachate. This has been a pretty dry summer. I don't know if, if uh, moisture, the rainfall, has an effect on the leachate, but I've got to guess it does. And so we've seen a, probably a minimum of what uh, we could see in a wet year of leachate coming to Newport. And, uh, you know, I, I'm really concerned about this. Um, I was talking with a fellow who likes to fish um, on Saturday, and he said he likes to fish in South Bay. He said this year, though, 
he's had to pull his, his prop up and clean it every uh, few minutes because there's a lot of growth in the bay. I don't think there are more farms. It's the uh, problem's been <coughs> uh, considered uh, a farm problem, a lot of it, but a lot of it is uh, is a treatment plant. And uh, I don't not knowing what we're putting in the water is a great concern. And um, I'd like to ask you uh, people who make the decisions uh, for Newport to stop taking leachate, stop polluting the water. And I think I heard Charlie with a, a list of other chemicals and compounds that are going into the water that are way above uh, the limits. So it's, it's not just PFAs, PFOAs, it's any of the chemicals that we're putting in the water. I mean, when I was a child, we didn't know better. We do now. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Susan Watson, once again. I'm wearing a different hat right now. <clears throat> I belong to a group, a charter uh, board group called Memphremago Community Marine. We are working very diligently to save the Northern Star tour boat on this lake. We have raised a quite a large amount of money from interested donors that we intend to submit a bid to buy the boat. This boat, our plans are to use it for educational purposes as well as uh, scientific purposes as well as giving tours on the lake. We are going to combine uh, with Memphremago Watershed and with Memphremago Commun um, MCI <laughs> out of Magog. Um, this is a tremendous asset for this lake, and if we or someone is not able to buy this and keep it on the lake, we'll lose it forever. But what good is this boat going to do us if we have a dead lake out there? Now this is a real economic issue. I know it's a health issue and I'm very concerned about the health aspect. I'm concerned about the fish in the lake that we eat. But I'm also concerned about the economic issue here with that boat. So um, hopefully we're going to be able to buy the boat and it's going to be a success and it's going to stay on this lake, but the lake has got to be pristine for us to be able to manage that. And if any of you would like to donate... <laughs> oh, no, 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 sorry, so much more so so I, I do have to cut you off on that. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Mrs. Sorry. That's, it's okay, Paul. I'll get you after the meeting. <laughs> I think I've got a question for either Mr. Gay or anybody from Sella. Um, apparently, there was testing done at one of the wells near the unlined area, and there was no testing of wells downgrading of the lined area. And has that changed at all? So there are one testing now of the wells that are downgrading of the lawn area. So for PFOAs. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we were asked to test uh, two wells. Um, excuse me. We were asked to test six wells at the landfill. Four of those wells were no detect. It wasn't there. One of the wells is downgrading and almost in the online landfill. Um, that's monitor well 2RR, and that had a concentration of 119 parts per trillion. That we knew, I think, the last time we were, we were here and shared that. Um, there is a side gradient well that was tested for 6.7 parts per trillion, uh, which is less than the standard. Um, and by the way, the Vermont standard is 20 parts per trillion, and the federal standard is 70. Um, so the state asked us because of the 119 parts per trillion adjacent to the online landfill, they said we want you to retest that well and we want you to test a well a little further away from the online landfill, closer to the river. We did that. The second test came back at 107 parts per trillion in the well adjacent to the landfill and no detect at the well a little further away from the online landfill. 
Um, so I think that answers your question. Okay. And um, where there is exceedances in your monitoring wells, if they're not immediately close, or are they immediately close to the source? In other words, do you track any of the leakage or migration um, of the contaminants from their source? Are you able to do that? or? Yeah. or so it was mentioned earlier that we don't test for any contaminants. Um, and we test for thousands and thousands and thousands twice a year um, in many wells, about 40 tunnel wells around there. Go up gradient, down gradient, side gradient, all over. Um, so there's thousands and thousands of analytical data that we have and the reports are prepared. So yes, I think you're sort of going into a little bit of a hydrogeological arena that I'm not an exact expert in, but Craig uh, is. Um, and he probably could answer that a little bit better. Well, I think you, you explained it. There are some wells that are very close to the online landfill and some wells that are very close to the lined landfill. Mm -hmm. Then there's a second row of wells further out. And so we, we and there are wells that are upgrading also, which you, we can use for comparison. Those are all sampled twice a year and analyzed for, for hundreds of, of constituents. So, and the ones that are, so the ones that are, are um, there's about th two wells now that um, uh, and we will be, and the permit um, is going to add a, add some more wells there um, that are about halfway from the unlined landfill edge to the river. That total distance from the unlined landfill to the river is about 700 feet. So the wells that are right close to the unlined landfill that are 10 feet or 50 feet away, most of them are showing um, some impact, relatively small concentrations, but some impact for sure. Um, the, the wells that are about halfway to the river, so three or four hundred feet to the river, are not showing any impacts. So there's no plume per se that you can follow back no. to a specific No, I mean we know the online landfill is causing groundwater impacts for sure. Now if everyone is aware that the unlined, and this includes the state, if everyone is aware that that unlined landfill section is leaking, why don't they put that on the front burner and say, okay, as of tomorrow, you're going to start digging that out? So why wait 18 years? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So um, there's two schools of thought on digging up an unlined landfill. There are some benefits because you remove, remove the long-term source of contamination. Short term, there could be larger impacts of the environment. You excavate that waste, you're going to have releases of gas, you're going to have rainfall, snow melt coming into the, into the waste, creating more leachate um, that has to be dealt with. Um, it's 550,000 yards of excavation. We all know we have very short construction seasons, and when you're dealing with water and freezing, you have complications with moving water that could be contaminated. So it's not going to be a, a, an, an easy task. Can it be done? Yes. Um, and throughout our landfill oversight committee meetings that we have, I would say probably half of the room is in support of removing the unlined landfill, getting it in a line landfill, remove the source for long term so we know it's gone. And then there's some that says, no, it's, it's, there's going to be more damage to the environment we know what the contamination is. It's not migrating any further away from where it is today. It's very stable. It's very well known. Um, and there could be uh, more impacts by removing the waste than just leaving it in place. Um, so I heard tonight, I think, some pretty ringing endorsement for removing it and putting it in the line landfill. In 18 years, when hopefully I'm still around and I'm still permitting, um, I think we're going to have some support for that. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Larry Gluckman. I've lived in the um, kingdom for 40 years. Um, my concern has nothing to do with what Casella is doing. And I agree that they're doing 
as good a job as they can. My concern is the appearance of what Newport is trying to do right now, and that is in a few weeks there's an economic development meeting going on. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, I read in the paper, there's 210 units for senior citizens. There's something going to happen to the whole. Now, with us beginning to turn the corner here in the kingdom, we have some information and we're going to ignore it. We're going to ignore the fact that there's potential of something happening to the wells in this area. People have to drink. And so on one hand, the select board can go ahead and take a stand, as Charlie suggested, until more information comes in. And that would sort of be a stone to the development of this area. And I think that's really important. Otherwise, we could play the three monkeys and, you know, hands, eyes, and mouth. And the fact is, is you have the information. And maybe all we need is a, a pause until the testing is done and everybody feels satisfied. And in the meantime, you're making a statement about what we hope happens here in Newport. And I think that's a really important consideration. I don't think we can sit here and say we've got a, we've got the New England's biggest dump or close to it, taking in all sorts of stuff, and we're still trying to be an economic center for this part of Vermont. Yeah. I think it's incongruous, just like the gentleman here said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> Um, I'm going to go back to this. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just go back to this table that you presented. Was this part of the permit, or is this just? It's it's in the packages. That's a, a testing of the leach eight coming out of this plant. coming out of well the the one in yellow is coming out of this plant. They tested which was above the standard. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, everything in bold is above the screen. Is Pedro still up here? Is Pedro? I it might be worthwhile to talk to Pedro and find out what the process is and what the test for. Pedro, if you don't mind being... Well, that, that's a test strictly for PFO. By... By... Pedro, do you know anything about this test? That we don't test for PFOAs or PFAs. We do not test. No, City of no. Newport does not. They're not required. So They're this came required. from an independent or came from medicine. a state order. Uh, their name is. I'm trying to find well, it. Well, it says Weston and Sampson. That's over here. Yeah. But the state. That's a 383-page report. Weston and Sampson got this year. The state uh, contracted with Weston and Sampson to go down to all the wastewater plants and test our sludge for PFOAs and leaching. They didn't test our leachate. Yes, they did. That's, that's well, the they didn't. They didn't at the wastewater plant, Charlie. Well, all they did is come and all that, and they took they took the sludge out of the storage tank and all that. If they got leachate, they went someplace else and got it, but they didn't get it from the wastewater plant. That's just not true. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, maybe it wasn't there that day. Right here. That's leachate. I don't know. They that's all leachate. They, they also did. tested the sludge, which is also part of that report. Right. Three hundred eighty-three I'm just. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, get, yeah. it's not coming from me, that's their report. Yeah, <clears throat> And it's in the permit. If you open that thing up, it's one yeah, of the yeah. tests. It's 383 pages long. That's like page 30. Well, oh, no, because it concerns me when I see the, sure. the stuff yeah, sure. that's exceeding. That's why I handed it to you. you know, that's They're all bold. They're all above the screen. Right. That's what my big concern is yeah. when I see yeah. that yeah. we're <laughs> above. <laughs> I would no, think that we would have to contact that company to find out what they use for testing because if Pedro says they didn't test the leachate over here, they must have gotten it from somewhere. They got it from Newport Waste. It says Newport, Newport leachate. Yeah, I know that, but... I read the whole report. But we've got a gentleman that's there almost 24-7. seven. First of all, the leachate ain't on our site. Well, maybe they tested the leachate coming in here. The leachate's over at the city garage in the tank that they dump there, and then it gets put in our pump station, and from the pump station it gets diluted with the wastewater, and then it comes to the wastewater plant. So if he did, then that's not and that's not our property. So he had all the right to go over there, and that, that's Casella's tank. That's probably <laughs> They also tested the ethylene, which is your problem. Coming out of the plant. 
So but, I'm going to have to look at the report to see. But they have to test the PFOAs it. because they can't treat PFOAs. So what that is, is coming back up because they can't treat it. Can't treat it. Okay. Joe? I, it's been a long night, and I know um, probably everybody's kind of had it up to here with the landfill, and I understand it's an emotional topic. I'd like to invite the board, uh, and I'm not looking for a, a date, but if you'd like to come <laughs> to the landfill uh, for a tour, um, or anybody in the room that would like to come up to the landfill for a tour, maybe a little more relaxed and get around and see some of these things, um, the invitation is open. Um, I understand that the city of Newport's wastewater treatment plant permit is up for renewal, and I've heard a lot of smirks in here tonight about the Agency of Natural Resources and the Waste Management Division mm -hmm. and the Watership Management Division. I personally think that they do a very good job and it's a, a bunch of very talented people at the agency. Um, I understand they're looking at your permit right now and they're evaluating everything that's been talked about tonight. They also did the same thing with our permit, which was just issued. We've got three conditions specific to PFOAs, and I think that's good. I think we need to look at what's in the waste stream. I think we need to look at what's in the leachate. Uh, we fully support the city and its wastewater treatment plant and its compliance with its permits. Um, if anything needs to be done, including shutting the leachate off because it's a bad thing, and it's proven to be a bad thing, which we don't know, We've also heard tonight a bunch of times that we don't know. We don't know. So if we don't know, let's wait till we know um, and make that decision at that point. Um, because maybe the leachate does not have an impact on the lake. The city of Sherbrooke just recently won an award for the cleanest drinking water in the province. Um, so uh, the drinking water is pretty good. So. If we're not having it, or the city is not having an impact on the city of Sherbrooke is asking you to stop the leachate in the lake. Yeah. That's straightforward yeah. in Dermanwall. It's right there. So stop saying that they have the best water. First of all, that was true. It's not true anymore. Today, the best water in Quebec is uh, around Quebec City, where they bought all the land from the, the lake to <coughs> the, to the uh, treatment facility. They bought all the land, like New York did. So Sherbrooke is not the best water now in Quebec. It's well, a city it, it was in the fall of 2000. As of today, that's all I know. So, um, so I would say let's just look at the state's permit issuance and the conditions that they're going to put on the city for the treatment of all its wastewater, which includes our leachate. We have other um, information that we need to get. Materials that we treat, including from Derby, they own 11 percent of that facility. I'm looking at Pedro. We have septage haulers. We have campers. Is there any other one that I? Industrial. Don't? We have Columbia Forest, the hospital, nursing homes, and stuff like that. that we in the prison, places like that too. That we, the state is asking me to start to test them too to see what they're discharging for us, especially because of our new, uh, the new P. PO4 phosphorus limitations and the nitrogens and all that, we're going to have to start testing for them. So we're, I know our permit's going to be a lot stricter than it has in the past. Um, I don't know exactly what we're going to be asked to do, but I know from what I've been gathering from the people of DEC that it's going to be more stringent than it was prior to, to the opening. I just want one final comment, and I hope that you guys go to a vote on it. What I heard from Casella was, <clears throat> We don't know. We're probably, we, it's possible we're poisoning your lake. We want you to wait until we know you're poisoning your lake. What I asked you right. was to stop now. If they can prove to you they're not poisoning your lake, you can start taking it again. Simple. It's the precautionary step. Mm -hmm. I believe from everything I've read, nobody knows. PFOAs are bad, bad things. And we're dumping a whole lot of it in the, in the water. It's got nothing to do with Casella, they can put it in Montpelier. So the first part of that, all I want is for you to, to make your motion right now. until you know that it's safe, you stop. That's what that's what I'm asking you to do. Not let's wait until you know the state figures it out. Well I can tell you that could be twenty years from now. And today is the time to do it. Now's the time to do it. Now's when their permit's going through, now's now is when it's up to happen. Yeah. 
you know, to push it off just so it's out of sight, out of mind, and it doesn't come up again is not the right solution. The reason I'm asking you to, uh, to take that same stance on the expansion is an, until they can prove that it's safe. That's, that's what I asked for in a motion. I don't think that's too much to ask. It's, it's, and I think it's your duty to do that for your, for your public, for our neighbors. I see that. Did you? No I need to answer the new court. I just want to say that I really appreciate this, this discussion tonight and that um, I believe it's been very factual as opposed to emotional. And I think it's been very um, helpful for all of us. And I appreciate the council making a forum um, like this happen. And, and to listen so carefully and ask the questions. It's very helpful to all the citizens and we can feel confident that we're being heard. And, and because we're being heard, we're not being emotional. We're, we're sticking to the facts. Okay. Mr. Schmidt. When does the Act 250 begin the process? It doesn't stay It depends on appeal. There's 30 days to appeal this permit by somebody. I don't know if anybody's appealing it at this point or not. We won't that would that be the expansion portion of it. <clears throat> no, the, the, yes. Well, that's the only permit they've got. So. Right. Yeah, 250 as far as the remote. That'll start. It doesn't start until sometime next year. I think, right? We don't have a date. Do you have a date on that, Henry? No, I don't. But I yeah. think if there's a 30-day appeal period now, and then it will be formally approved or not approved, and then at any time thereafter, the Act 250 review can occur. This has to, the A and R review has to stop first. Mm -hmm. But the expansion permit that they've been granted, mm -hmm. that's where the 30 day process yeah. begins or began last week or whatever? To appeal. In, to appeal. To appeal. To appeal. Okay, yeah. that's on the expansion. That's right. Correct. Right. Thank you. Okay, anything else from anyone in the audience? Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to add before we close, first of all, we appreciate very much you invite us. You know, I don't even know how, how much my car weighs. When you're talking about 500,000 tons, how much is it? Well, 500,000 tons is what the municipality of Montreal produces in one year, 600,000 tons. That's the volume coming in there. So, 2 million people in the city of Montreal produce 600,000 tons. And here we have 500,000 tons coming in here. I don't know how much is 500,000 tons. A study from the University of Quebec claimed that it's about 7,000 trucks. 7,000 trucks. Now, now they push all this garbage, you know, so it may, not, may be just half of it. But when that study was done for the city of Montreal, 600,000 tons represent 71,000 trucks. That's a hell of a lot of garbage coming in the North Country here. Okay, anything else? I'm gonna to turn to the council. Does anyone wish to make a motion? Before, okay, I wanna ask you folks here, would you prefer that a motion be done before a full board? I would like it to be done the sooner the better. So you want it done now with one number missing? It's up to you. We can do it either way. Well, I expect that all three of you that are here are responsible. Okay. Um, Does anybody wish to make a motion? The mayor can be the fourth. Does anybody wish to make a motion regarding what? Mr. Pronto wishes the council to do, which is one, to immediately stop taking leach A from Casella. That would be one motion, mm -hmm. if anyone so chooses. And the next would be to take a stand for Act 250, opposing mm -hmm. the expansion. Until we, basically, both of no, them, until for we, Act 250. No. Just to take, we, we would bring that letter to Act of oh. for the council to take a stance on opposing the expansion until they can prove that it's, everything is safe. Same thing with the region. But you can put that as an addendum to it. So they can prove it in a year, 
And, um, and you want to take the leachate back, then that $29 Laura was talking about would only affect everybody. It takes 20 years or so. Does anybody on the council wish to make a motion regarding this? I'll make that motion. We go ahead and stop taking leachate and that the city of Newport take stand against the expansion of the landfill in Calgary. Can I modify that, please? How would you like to modify it? I think you want to say stop taking the gin until proper testing is, is um, made available, no. right? Well, well, not proper testing, when, proven. When could that be done? That's something that your motion is going to force the um, ANR to take some action. Okay. If, so I don't if know. It, if it requires that, then yes, I would modify it to state yeah. that as well. Yeah. Proper testing? Proof of Proof of Proof that's safe. Proof of Proof that it's safe. Proof Proof that it's safe. safe. Okay. So that's... So the motion for that's been made. Is there a second? I'll second that. Motion made and seconded. Could you read the exact motion back? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I just want to have it because it's very important. I think the motion says that then it's moved to stop taking leachate and take a stance on the expansion until proper testing proves that there's no yet no oil there in the ground. That PFAS and PFOAs. Yeah. So a motion has been made and seconded. Made by Mr. Schnett, seconded by Mr. Ross. Discussion, any discussion on the motion? We're just limiting that to testing those two chemicals. I would test any they test for anything they want. I would even make sure that that way to make it in motion that I, instead of testing for that list. This list, um, he said. That has quite a bit. Um, and is that the limited a list of that? That is that is the array of PFOAs that they tested. PFAS. Which they tested, which PFOA is. But I think Kevin is referring to all testing. Yeah. Because there's other meadows. Well, I mean, it wouldn't hurt for you to say all testing is safe. I don't think you're going to be able to yeah, say that. According to who's standing Well, that gentleman back there was saying, uh, I'm sorry, I forget your name, the one from Lindeville? Yeah, Ani Miller. Ani um, Miller. What other. There was, did you say dioxins? Yeah, well, just, uh, there's a, uh, what my point was is there's just a whole, there's a whole battery of, of contaminants that have been um, approved by the federal government, and uh, those have, we've, we've learned, as, as several other people have articulated here very well, that we've learned down the road that our federal government wasn't, was, was a little bit ahead of their headlights, uh, <laughs> being very nice to them, and so, I think I think it's really uh, I, I'm very grateful that the board is considering this aspect because what I was trying to say is that it's a, the, the, the whole regulatory system is faulty. These chemicals become approved and, and are used before full testing proves later that they were they were incredibly lethal. And again, I mentioned DDT, lead, um, PCBs, etc. So I don't know how you would articulate that, but. Um, I, I think it's some very serious concerns uh, on that issue and how you articulate that. I, I, you know, I'm not sure how to make it clear. Thank you. So, my, my point is, if you make the motion, we just limit it to the, the FOAs, the FAS, are we just ignoring a whole bunch of other things? That can well, apparently we don't know that and the state doesn't know that. <laughs> I don't think you know yet what the other nobody are. knows anything. I would I would rather err on the side of caution. <clears throat> right, I just me too. I just yeah. want to be until we can know that that discharge is safe. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Anything else from council? And then I'm going to go to Ann. Uh, Mr. Shinnett has once suggested this before, which is the council could always change its mind later on. I don't know that you need to put in that proviso. I think you decided on the evidence uh, presented to you uh, today, 
that you should stop taking, or you can decide you should stop taking leachate at any time, and that's all the motion really needs to be, at any time in the future, based on evidence that's presented to you, when you find that you think it's safe, you can decide to start taking leachate again. So you don't need that um, safety issue which creates uh, uh, a question of who's going to decide what's safe and when, when will we decide, is, is it 20 parts per million, 19 parts per million, it, or when it's safe. Just leave that part out. Yep. When they come back to you, whenever anybody comes back to you and says, hey, look, look at all this testing, we've shown this is safe, then start taking the leachate again. You don't need that little part in, the mo in your motion about until it's safe. Just, we shouldn't be taking leachate now, based on what you've heard. Yep. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I was trying to do. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I comment on that? The safe thing was my idea. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, if it's safe or unsafe, does it matter what chemical it is that's unsafe? So, so I would probably leave that out too. In that case, Mr. Ross would have to withdraw his motion. Um, excuse me, a second for me to amend my motion. I'll withdraw my second. Okay, then I would amend the motion to to strike that section of the uh, I've done it. Now tell me exactly what you want. Or is your Um you want to stop taking leaching. But you don't have any standards to tell you when it's going to be open for discussion again. And I again I hate to be the bad guy, but leaching is not the only stuff you take. I can't hear you. Can you I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, I can't hear uh, the city manager. Can she speak Heather. louder? Leachate is not the only material that you take. So how do you equate with the testing that's available that leachate is the bad guy? How do you know with the testing that's available, and if you stop taking it, how do you proceed with testing to determine that it's safe? Your motion yeah. said you're stopping to take the leaching until you can determine that it is safe. We're not talking about stuff you're taking from North Country or Europe. You're talking about the leaching from Cassandra. Right? So, so, so how, does that, how does that advance you when we're still treating it? I mean, I, I think there's something we missing. We won't be treating it. But I'm expecting that with the limited amount of leaching that we will be taking in, it, significant numbers would be shown that it's bad. So uh, Pedro, it's going to get better. But I'm going to ask Pedro that because he's the expert. Right. Okay. We're in discussion. This without a second. Yes, that's what I'm going to say. We need a second to his motion. Have we completed okay. this? We'll just stop taking the leaching. I got to move that Dennis will stop taking the leaching to the. Until it's determined that it's safe. Okay, in order for further discussion to go on, we do it on the second. No, you already did that. Put it on. I'll put it on? Yep. I'll <laughs> second that. Okay. okay, so now. Yes, thank you. I was about to say oh, that. Okay, no, I'm glad you, because I was about to say that. Mm -hmm. um, so now, Pedro. Yes. What do you want me to answer? <laughs> <laughs> At what point? Do we know if the leachate is safe? How are we going to know? You don't have any guidelines from the state. We have a standard. It's we'll going to be 20. We'll, we'll all, just make it simple for you, Dennis. If the state gives us a permit right now to discharge, we're going to a new permit to discharge. We're meeting our permit to discharge at this point in time. We did a wet test for our new permit to discharge. The state asked us to do, do, do it. And that we sent the, we had to find a company who would do it. It was one out of South Hampton, New Hampshire. Um, you've got that right in your hand. Yep. It's pretty lengthy and it's pretty entailed. Um, I, I had to send it to the state. When I got it back, I sent it to the state. The state is analyzing it and they're digesting it. They said that they look pretty good to them, but they want to go through all the aspects and stuff like that. I have no answers yet of what, what, what's going on with the wet test. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it not? All right. We have other things that we've been testing for, other places that's been coming in. Um, that we need to look at too, and all that. 
the scum of it's just in our regular sewer, some of it's coming from our septage haulers, some of it's coming from the village in here. Um, so as a mayor, I mean, excuse me, as a city manager, so you know, we can stop the leachate, but is, is some of the stuff that you uh, want us, you're talking about testing, which the state's telling us that we don't have to test for, and how are we going to know? Okay. You know, I, I mean, I'd like to see, I would like to be able to, in my own personal opinion, because I'd like to have the state get back to us and say, what is that web test showing us? And then work backwards from there. Any idea when the state would get back to I've been, I've been trying to get in touch with them since the middle of last week so I could get an answer for you tonight. The city manager asked me, and I've been working very digitally on trying to get an answer from them. But sometimes, as Charlie says, things with the state don't work that fast. But they didn't test for this stuff. They the tested test. for all I, they called me, told me that they were testing for PFOAs in our sludge. They West and West and Samson come and we give the samples of our sludge and all that. As far as the effluent, you know, they can take effluent tests from the state. We do them all the time, you know, and everything else. So whatever they got, I mean, everything we do is public record. There's nothing to be hit. But do we test, just in my mind again, do we test what's coming out of the pipe into the Clyde River for PFOAs? No. That's my exactly. answer there. And the and they never have. And can I this year was the first time that they they called right. us no, and said that's we're going to start doing it. Right. And that's that. the unknown factor. Unknown unknown is it there and not how we're going to treat it is the unknown. Yeah. They know it's there. Yeah. The wet test just just I don't want that to confuse you to what you're doing. The wet test lumps eighty thousand organisms or so all into one. They do not say it's PFOA, it's lead, it's arsenic, it just says it's either there or it's not there. It doesn't have a thing to do with PFOAs or PFOA. They, they, they can't treat for it. Everything I read to you earlier says they can't test for it. They don't know what standards are accurate, they're waiting for testing, and the treatment process, the wastewater treatment facility, does not efficiently remove it. I mean, I, so we're kind of going around in circles here. Circles, I want we're going around, around in circles, and I don't want you to get confused and look at the shiny object over here because it doesn't, that the wet test has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Zero. I have one other thing to offer. One of the things that Pedro has discussed and trying to figure out how to work with this is um, sort of doing a cleanse of the um, wastewater treatment facility. And that would mean to, to have a period of time where everything is shut off, everything that we have control, and then taking our measurements and then gradually reintroducing those influence to try to find out what the numbers should be and, and how to work with those. Why, why are you so against I'm not waiting against. until a toxic chemical I'm that not, we know is there I'm not is against. not treated. I don't so understand. What I am doing, Charlie, is my job. Well, I am you. doing my so job as the city manager to okay. make sure that they have well-rounded information. Okay. That's my job. Okay. I'm gonna, I think we've uh, discussed this. We have a motion. It's been seconded. Then all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was unanimous. I like to be on record. I don't normally vote, but I want to be on record as I. But I don't normally vote, but I want to be put down as an I. Thank you All very right. much, guys. You're my good <laughs> No, we're all set. I just need a letter. No, he didn't vote on that. On that 250 also, that was part of it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. I want you to meet in a new
I'm sorry, but she's speaking up. I mean, if we need to get a PA system, we yes. have people out there. Yes. But the door was open. You know, we understand. There's no need to keep hounding the city manager. She's but, doing, but I, I'm entitled to hear. Well, I, well I'm not going to get into it. She's doing the best she can. And we had people behind her. And the new business is that we're coming into the budget season. So I just want to let you know what to expect um, because our next meeting will be November 5th. So um, we're going through the audit and we'll be coming to the board um, I'm planning on November 5th for reassignments, um, commitments, assignments, and what's the third word? Reassignments. Reassignment for the audit. So um, we're working with an auditor and we'll be having, um, I, I'm very uh, pleased with how the audit is turning out. So we'll, I hope to have the official recommendations at November 5th meeting. And then we'll go into our budget generating process, which you've been through before. We'll come up with a draft and present it to you on the screens. You'll have an opportunity to speak to each department head. And we'll have executive sessions scheduled with each department head as well. Um, last year and the year before, by pure coincidence, we were able to approve our budget on January 4th. So from that process, from about November 5th through the month of November and December, sometimes we hold special meetings just for the specific purpose of going over the budget. So I just wanted to let you know we're coming into that season and, and what to expect. That's all I have for the business. Okay. business. Mr. Johnson, old business. No, I do. I got the council got to sign loan documents on the new police car. So if everybody looked at it, it's a, I think it's a uh, 2018 Explorer. He's trading in the 2013. That's the so lease. $6,700 for it. There is money in the budget. Money was budgeted for this car. That's the lease. The lease of the vehicle, correct? Oh, no. no. no we, we buy it. We, we buy it. Service okay. Them. That serves them for three years instead of. Okay. So we just need to sign these yeah. and send them out. I was trying to see what the interest rate was. Okay, 2.59 percent. Hmm? I wish I'd got mine for that. <laughs> you didn't get your car for 2.59 percent? I don't think so. I need to buy a cruiser. 
<laughs> you don't have the city wiper card. You know. I don't think so. <laughs> well, they do, don't they? Don't you get paid every week? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh that's true. <laughs> I gotta be careful. Yeah. Sign in the right spot there. <laughs> Can somebody else tell me that? <laughs> Is that all of us? No, we're gonna get Mr. Sharpen up. Any other old business? No. Oh, yeah. Any old business? Yes. The meeting for the dock and mooring committee is probably going to happen on the 22nd from 3 to 5. The 22nd of this one. Very good. Um, anything else? I don't have anything. Any Nothing old business? Any old business? Old. Just I'm glad it's happening till five because then you can all go over to the um, unveiling of the development, the waterfront and downtown development. I printed up a few of these hoping that you would take them. And I've got some for members of the audience as well. If you just want to pass those down. And hope to see you there. The planning's going very well. So we're excited about it. Just wanted to mention it again so it would be on the radar screens. That's all I have. Okay. Now we need an executive session to discuss labor relation agreements, one BSA 313A1. Do we need a motion? I understand that, Mr. Mayor. Let me give you a motion here. Um, I move to find the premature general public knowledge of the subjects of the anticipated executive session tonight will clearly place the board and or persons involved at a substantial disadvantage. A motion's been made. Is there a second to that motion? I second that one. Main seconded. Any discussion? And all those in favor say aye. Aye. And also, I also move that we enter into executive session to discuss labor relations under VSA Chapter 1, 313, a one. The motion is made. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. We're going to executive session.